So, I've had some time to sit with Beyonce's latest album, Renaissance, and in doing so, I've concluded that Beyonce is truly one of the most innovative artists of this century. Through taking inspiration from the intersections of her identity and the identity of her fans, Beyonce crafts a holistic picture of how she views the world as a millennial black woman. She may rarely do interviews, but the music itself could be interpreted as her personal diary of her deepest thoughts. Today, me and you are going to explore it, the looks, the tea, and everything in between. As a younger Beyonce fan, I was introduced to and fell in love with her music when she was in her prime pop girl era, which was from about 2006 with the release of B-Day to around 2013. In this video series, I want to do a retrospective of all her eras from her breakout debut Dangerously In Love to Lemonade to Renaissance. Now let's get into it. Today is Dangerously In Love. Now let's get into it. Dangerously In Love was released June 20th, 2003 through Columbia Records and Music World Entertainment. I would say early 2000s music was a transitional period where artists were infusing the past with the future, creating new sounds from it. The album was recorded in late 2002 when the group Destiny's Child was on their hiatus. At this time, the girls took some time to work on their solo projects. Before Beyonce began recording for Dangerously In Love, she personally selected the producers to collaborate with. Over a period of two days, she held meetings with respective producers. Beyonce went to Miami, Florida to begin to work on the album with record producer Scott Stortz and lived in a Miami hotel in the following months so she could concentrate on the album. Beyonce took her time to avoid pressure buildup, significantly different from her hasty productions of Destiny's Child, where they had to pop out heads faster than McDonald's 10 minutes before closing. Like she did on Survivor and numerous other Destiny's Child hits, Beyonce took a wider role in the production of Dangerously in Love, co-writing a majority of the songs, choosing which ones to produce and sharing ideas on the mixing and mastering of tracks. With 43 songs completed, 15 made it to the album. Beyonce felt that recording an album without her groupmates was liberating and therapeutic, coming into the studio and freely expressing her ideas with her collaborators. The dependency she developed with Destiny's Child, however, meant it was so much harder for her to be on her own creatively. Besides Jay-Z, Beyonce was able to work with Jamaican artist Sean Paul, American rapper Missy Elliott, among others. In contrast, some artists sent copies of songs to Beyonce, which were eventually produced. Beyonce also worked with Missy Elliott and Timbaland on the track titled Wrath Around Me, but it ultimately failed to appear on the album. Dangerously in Love was originally a song of the same title which Beyonce had written for Survivor. The song was deemed too sophisticated compared to the other songs on Survivor, so the group decided not to release it as a single off the album. After recording several tracks for her album, Beyonce decided to add it. After realizing that it fit the overriding theme of the album, that's why Dangerously in Love, the song, appears on Survivor and her debut album. Since the album's release date was postponed to capitalize on the success of Kelly Rowland's Dilemma, Beyonce had the chance to further enhance the album. Although she was disappointed with the move, she realized that everything happens for a reason. This allowed her to record more songs, including the album's lead single, Crazy in Love, produced by Rich Harrison. Before meeting Beyonce, Rich Harrison had conceptualized the beat of the song, which had sampled the hook's instrumentation from the 1970s song, Are You My Woman? Tell Me So. Originally written and composed by Eugene Records, frontman of the Chicago-based vocal group Chillites. When Harrison played the beat to his friends, they weren't the biggest fans of it. This made him realize that he had conceived something special, and people would appreciate it better after hearing the whole record. Thus, Harrison decided not to market the selection, and instead he waited for the right artist to record it. In late 2002, Beyonce paused working on Dangerously in Love for a holiday tour with Destiny's Child. With a few weeks left for recording in March 2003, Beyonce was still collaborating with other guests on the album, including Sean Paul and P. Diddy. The creative output for the sessions for Dangerously in Love left several tracks ready for another album pressing. In late 2003, Beyonce planned to release a follow-up album that would comprise leftover songs from Dangerously in Love. The move was prompted when P. Diddy collaborated in the song called Summertime, a leftover track from the album, which was sent to radio stations and had received favorable responses. 
I absolutely love that song, by the way. It's simple and the lyrics are so soulful. What do Beyonce, Jennifer Lopez, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, Kim Kardashian, Pharrell Williams, Kanye West, and Lady Gaga all have in common? They were all shot by this guy, Marcus Klinko. He gave an interview with the social media post editing site, PixArt, where he recollects his time working with Beyonce to create the stunning images on her first album. He said, I will share something very timely seeing as Beyonce and Jay-Z just released their album, Everything Is Love. It's the 15th anniversary of Beyonce's Dangerously In Love and I want to share a story about when they came to see me about the shoot of the album cover. Beyonce's mom was styling the shoot and it was a diamond top. Her mom wanted her to wear a red carpet long skirt with it, but I thought it would look great with denim. The problem was they didn't bring any denim jeans with them. So I said, you can have mine. So this iconic album cover, she was wearing my men's d &G jeans. It was so nice with the diamond top, it created great tension. Beyonce is the lead image of the exhibit. And I think this is a funny little anecdote. We created a trend and then everyone was wearing these men's jeans with sparkles. I thought this bit was so cute and it just shows how random and messy the creative process is sometimes. We get so caught up in the processes and wanting everything to be perfect, but moments like this, humble us in a way. Remember when artists actually cared deeply and had budgets to create an album cover that meant something? I feel like album covers have become lazy or clickbaity, but let's move on. Dangerously in Love is a beautiful mix of sultry, up-tempo ballads that truly is a solid body of work and was an instant classic at its release. Before its release, executives at her label criticized it because it didn't fit the sounds of the existing R&B records at the time. In 2003, and for much of the early 2000s, R&B was dominating the charts. At this time, rap music was just starting to become more mainstream as well. Beyonce said that someone, probably a record label executive, said that her album had no hits on it and was a major flop. To much surprise later, however, the album superseded expectations and dominated the Billboard charts for weeks. Beyonce's father and manager at the time, Matthew Knowles, said that Dangerously in Love showcases her musical roots. While Michelle Williams and Kelly Rowland were gospel and alternative pop respectively, Beyonce focused on recording R&B songs. Songs in the album are varied from mid-tempo and club-oriented tracks in the first half and ballads in the second half. Beyonce describes the sound of this album saying, My album is a good balance of ballads, mid-tempos with just riding in your car feels, to a lot of up-tempo club songs, to really sexy songs, to songs that make you feel emotional. The album contains high energy songs like Crazy in Love and Naughty Girl. The album's vocal mode, however, is slow and moody and a bit sultry. Beyonce said she had written many ballads for the album. According to Beyonce, she wanted to be understood as an artist and showcase her range. And by doing so, she blended various genres and music influences in the album. The album incorporates R&B with classic tracks like Me, Myself, and I, and Speechless, hip hop tracks like Crazy in Love and That's How You Like It, so with songs like The Close I Get To You, and reggae influences with famous collaborations on the track Baby Boy with reggae artist Sean Paul. The album took hip hop influences from Jay-Z, Outkast, and Little Kim, the reggae from Sean Paul, and courtesy of Storch, the album explores Arabic music as well. With Naughty Boy and Baby Boy, my personal favorites off the album, Sean Paul's personal study of that kind of music gave the album a Middle Eastern vibe. Beyonce and the producers also had a wide variety of instrumentations. When O3 Bonnie and Clyde was released as a single in late 2002, critics and the public had speculated that Beyonce and Jay-Z were dating. Despite widespread rumors, they remained silent about their relationship for obvious reasons. According to critics, the title itself on the album sounded more intriguing with Beyonce singing personal songs. Though love is the theme of the album, Beyonce said that the album had material that is vague enough to be about any relationship. However, there are songs that suggest affirmations of their relationship. In the song Signs, Beyonce sings about being in love with a Sagittarius, which coincidentally is Jay-Z's zodiac sign. In classic B fashion, she responded to the rumors saying, people can come to whatever conclusion they like. That's the beauty of music. I'm a singer. I talk about writing songs all you want, but when it comes to certain personal things any normal person wouldn't tell people they don't know, I just feel like I don't have to talk about it. The Crazy in Love singer said, 
Dangerously in Love is lyrically similar to Destiny's Child's albums, but because she only had to write for herself, Beyonce had the chance to compose personally deeper songs than her previous records with the group. With a theme that is based upon different stages of a romantic relationship, Dangerously in Love contains songs that speak of love and honesty. In addition, Beyonce admitted that there are songs about lovemaking. The personal content of the album, however, was not generally attributed to Beyonce's own experiences. Although some were based on from hers, instead the theme kept reoccurring in her mind. Beyonce actually later explained that, I wanted to have an album that everyone could relate to and would listen to as long as I'm alive and even after. Love is something that never goes out of style. It's something everyone experiences. And if they're not in love, people usually want to feel it. I would say that songs on this album encapsulates romance in your early 20s, like early adulthood, when the feelings are fresh and powerful. As Beyonce matured, so did her music and her lyrics about love and heartbreak. While some songs merely focus on the beauty of love, the album also explores another side of love with songs that celebrate breakup and songs that narrate a woman's desire to have a degree of control in their relationship. The album's hidden track, Daddy, is a tribute to Beyonce's father, Matthew Knowles, who fronted Destiny's Child as their manager. The song is on account of Beyonce wanting her future husband and child to possess qualities similar to her father's. Originally, Beyonce did not intend to include the track on the album, having thought its lyrics would make her appear immature. However, considering it's one of the songs that reflected her life at the transitional moment, she instead regulated Daddy as the closing track. Dangerously in Love and its singles earned Beyonce numerous awards and nominations. Beyonce was recognized as new female artist and new R&B artist among the four awards she won during the 2003 Billboard Awards. Dangerously in Love and its singles earned Beyonce numerous awards and nominations. Beyonce won new female artist and new R&B artist among the four awards she won during the 2003 Billboard Awards. It also received a nomination in the category for Best Album at the 2003 MOBO Awards. At the 46th Annual Grammy Awards, Beyonce won Best Contemporary R&B Album along with four other awards for the album's songs. With that accomplishment, she tied with Alicia Keys, Nora Jones, and Lauryn Hill for most Grammy Awards won by a female artist in one night. At the 2004 Brit Awards, the album was nominated in the for Best International Album, but lost to Justin Timberlake's Justified. However, the singer herself won the category for International Female Solo Artist. Dangerously in Love was also nominated in the category for Best Album at the 2004 MTV Music Awards in Europe. The thousandth issue of Entertainment Weekly, which celebrated the new classics in the entertainment industry in the period of 1983 to 2008, ranked Dangerously in Love 19 on its list top 100 best albums of the past 25 years, which is no easy feat. The album also ranked number 183 on the list of 200 definitive albums that shaped rock and roll according to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A public poll on MTV Base in 2009 placed the album at number 58 on the greatest albums ever. In 2021, Consequence of Sound named Dangerously in Love one of the 10 solo albums every music fan should have, stating that Beyonce's wide appeal is obvious when you could consider the scope of R&B perfection she delivers on her debut. Crazy in Love and Baby Boy are both songs on the album that achieved massive commercial success and they have become B's most iconic songs to this day. This album was very, very well received, solidifying Miss Carter as a solo artist and a new force in the music industry. Her next project was more risky, making Beyonce not only an R&B girl, but a force in mainstream pop music in the coming decade. Stay tuned for the next video where I dive in deeper into my personal favorite era, B-Day. Peace out. Aggressive, I'm strong, I'm fearless. She's still a survivor. Destiny Child, though they were still popular, the street cred was wavering a little bit. She's still crazy in love. I got married in the Hamptons. And now, she's truly an independent woman. If you had to choose between a career and a personal life, which would you choose? Dropping her new album, B-Day, on the eve of her own 25th. It's the record that women need to hear. 
There's no question that Beyonce is in control of her own destiny. I know who I am. That's something that women take a long time to be able to say with confidence. So ring the alarm, because the hottest chick in the game is coming. All lies on me. Now, let's get into my personal favorite, B-Day, which to some could be defined as her first visual album. This was the album with the looks, with Beyonce having some of her most experimental and breathtaking performances. This was commercial B. This was the B on Nintendo commercials and starring in major motion films. Originally set to be released in 2004, the album was planned to follow up to Beyonce's 2003 solo debut, Dangerously in Love. However, it was delayed to accommodate the recording of Destiny's Child final album, Destiny's Fulfilled. Beyonce starred as Deanna Jones in the hit remake of Dreamgirls, alongside Jennifer Hudson and Anoni Nika Rose. the film, while on vacation after filming, Beyonce began contacting various producers and rented Sony Music Studios completing B-Day in two weeks. Two weeks. And it still sounds good. Talk about work ethic. This bright idea to do a music video album. I had two weeks to do eight videos. It's crazy. Some could say the sound of the album is a bit dated, but it's an acquired taste in 2022, but still great music nonetheless. Most of the lyrical content on the album was inspired by Beyonce's role in Dreamgirls and its musical style ranging from the 1970s to 1980s funk influences and balladry to urban contemporary elements such as hip-hop and R&B. Live instrumentation was employed in recording most of the tracks as part of Beyonce's vision of creating a record using live instruments. The instrumentation on the song Greenlight is so well produced and my favorite off the album. In 2002, Beyonce had productive studio sessions while making her debut album Dangerously in Love, recording 45 songs. At the release of Dangerously in Love in 2003, Beyonce had planned to follow up with an album releasing several of the leftover tracks. However, on January 7, 2004, a spokesperson on her record label Columbia Records announced that Beyonce had put plans on hold in order to concentrate on the recording of Destiny's Fulfilled. Legend says that fans are still waiting for that album. It was also scrapped because she wanted to sing the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl in Houston, Texas. In late 2005, Beyonce decided to postpone the recordings of her second studio album because she had landed the lead role in Dreamgirls. Since this was her biggest role yet, she wanted to focus on one project at a time, so Beyonce decided to wait until the film was completed before returning to the recording studio. When filming ended, B has so many things bottled up inside of her, so many emotions, so many ideas. We wanted to challenge myself and I wanted the videos to all have different feelings prompting her to begin working without telling her father and then manager, Matthew Knowles. Beyonce kept the recording of B-Day somewhat quiet, telling only her artists and teams of producers they contacted to collaborate for the album. She began working with songwriters and producers, Rich Harrison, who worked on her hit Crazy in Love, Rodney Jerkins, Sean Garrett, Cameron Wallace, Norwegian producer duo Stargate, American hip hop producer and rapper Swiss Beats, and Walter Millsap. Two female songwriters were also included in the production team who helped structure the album. These two songwriters were Beyonce's cousin, Angela Beyonce, who had previously collaborated on Dangerously in Love, and up-and-coming songwriter, Makeba Riddick, who had made her way onto the team after writing Deja Vu, which was the lead single off the album. Beyonce and her team brainstormed the lyrics and other collaborators such as the Neptunes, Durkins, and Swiss Beats would simultaneously produce the tracks. They would sometimes begin working at 11 o'clock, spending up to 14 hours a day in the studios during the recording process, all of the songs on the album. 
Michaela Riddick, a producer on the album, said in an interview with MTV News, recounting her experience with the production, saying, Beyonce had multiple producers in Sony Studios. She booked out the whole studio and she had the biggest and best producers in there. She would have us in one room, we would start collaborating with one producer, then she would go and start something else with another producer. We would bounce around to different rooms and work with producers. It definitely was a factory type of process. She was itching to get back into the studio, recording the album behind her father's, who was her manager at the time's back. During the course of two weeks, Beyonce alongside world-renowned producers knocked out B-Day primarily at Sony Music Studios in New York City. The album expanded upon Dangerous and Love's theme of funk-inspired songs with live instrumentation, along with elements of R&B, pop, and soul. The first single, Deja Vu, featuring Jay-Z, was released in 2006. Around the same time, Beyonce held auditions for an all-female band, which she named the Sugar Mamas. The 2006 BET Awards just happened to be three days away, and it was there that Beyonce performed the single for the first time. After, After a legendary performance at BET, which many still regard as being one of her best, Beyonce began embarking on the pre-promotional tour for the album. I say pre-promotional because longtime Beyonce fans knew back then that Beyonce would go on two tours to fully support her records. The first one would be a promotional campaign in which she would visit different parts of the world to perform singles from the album, give us interviews, etc. The second one would be the official world tour, which was the case with the Beyonce Experience World Tour, her first extended tour as a solo artist. After the video album was done, Beyonce made an appearance at the 2007 Grammys where she was introduced by Prince, whom she had previously done a duet at the 2004 Grammys to perform the song Listen. Two weeks later, she performed a Dreamgirls melody at the Oscars with co-stars Jennifer Hudson. She would then go on to perform a mini concert at the 2007 Houston Rodeo and kicked off the Beyonce Experience tour the following month. The tour itself was epic. It had five legs and spanned almost seven months as Beyonce traveled the globe to put a show for her many different fans around the world. Later that summer, Beyonce reunited with Kelly and Michelle at the 2007 BET Awards, joining together to perform the tracks Get Me Bodied and Kelly's lead single, Like This, featuring Eve from her album, Miss Kelly. The performance also includes an appearance from Solange with all four dancing together at the end. Many of the themes and the musical styles on the album were inspired by Beyonce's role in Dreamgirls. The plot of the film revolved around the Dreams, a fictional 1960s group of three female singers who attempted success in the mainstream industry with the help of their manager, Curtis Taylor. Beyonce portrays Dina Jones, the lead singer of the group and wife of Taylor, and is emotionally abused by him. Because of her role, Beyonce was inspired to produce an album with an overriding theme of feminism and female empowerment. In the bonus track, Encore for the Fans, Beyonce says, Because I was so inspired by Dina, I wrote songs that were saying all the things I wish I could say in the film. In my personal opinion, I would say that album seems like a reclamation of a lost voice. Beyonce almost plays a character in this album. The video concept seems to place her in a different versions of empowerment that can speak to many different women. The sound of the album was influenced by a variety of American genres, and like Beyonce's previous album, it incorporated urban contemporary elements, including contemporary R&B and hip hop. Some songs have a 1970s, 1980s style inspired through, through record sampling. Sugar Mama, which employs blue guitar samples from Jake Wade and the Soul Searchers Searching for the Soul contains 1970s funk and 1980s go-go influenced melodies. Upgrade You is sampled from Betty Wright's song Girls Can't Do What the Guys Do. It's day two of the video shoot and today we're doing Upgrade You. The theme of Upgrade You was metallics. We went with all silver metallics. What's up? I'm Jigga. Yo. I'm on for my first shot of the day. Recorded in 1968, Resentment used Curtis Mayfield's Think, Think instrumental from 1972 from the Superfly soundtrack. Deja Vu has 1970s influence. Give it to mama. Greenlight has a classic groove inspired by the go-go sound that was birthed in the DMV area and the major inspiration for the entire sound on the album. Other artists who used this sound at the time include artists like A. Marie, Ashanti, and Jennifer Lopez. Get Me Body features twang, a musical style that originated from Texas. 
Beyonce crafted most of the songs on B-Day through the live instrumentation and diverse techniques. This is evident on Deja Vu, which utilizes bass guitar, conga, hi-hat, horns, and 808 drums. It also features rap vocals by Jay-Z. In an interview with MTV, Beyonce says, When I recorded Deja Vu, I knew that even before I started working on the album, I wanted to add live instruments to all my songs. Lyrically, the song details a woman being constantly reminded of the past lover shown in lines, It's because I'm missing you that I'm having deja vu. The song Get Me Body is the second track on B-Day and is a moderate R&B and bounce song, which displays influences of dance pop, dance hall, and funk music, which speaks about a female protagonist going out and dressing up suitably to leave a lasting impression and get what she's looking for. Hence, Get Me Body. The following track, Sugar Mama, is a moderate R&B and soul song, which displays influences of 1960s as well as 1970s funk and rock music, also containing limited elements of 1980s go-go, and sounds more closely resembling live instruments and music Beyonce previously recorded. Lyrically, it features a female protagonist offering up the keys to her house and car and her credit card just, just to keep her love interest and his good loving at home presumably so that he can listen to her collection of old soul records. These interpretations are shown in lines like, it's so good to the point that I'll do anything to keep you home. Tell me what you want me to buy. My accountant's waiting on the phone. The woman also sees the man as a sex object, asking him to sit on her lap and take it off while I watch you perform. The album's fifth track and second single, Ring the Alarm, aka Don't Hurt Yourself Part 1, is an R&B song incorporating elements of punk rock is noted for having use of a siren in its melody, shows a harder edge to Beyonce's sound. I really love how experimental this album is. It completely went against the typical way pop artists released music back in 2006. That was so Especially with B's first album, Dangerously in Love, the safe route would have been to release the second version of that. But B had other plans. She wanted industry dominance, and B-Day was the start of this declaration. The sixth track, Kitty Cat, is a smooth R&B song with hip-hop influences. The female protagonist, who feels that her love interest has underestimated her. The song is unique being that it's less than two minutes, when most of the songs on the album were three minutes plus. Freakum Dress is a crescendo that uses the two-note riff and galloping beats. I would love if B made a remastered version of this song for Renaissance. The theme fits so well if you look at the music video. The R&B and funk breakup song Greenlight is a direct echo to Crazy Up the single and music video for Irreplaceable, one of her most successful songs to date. Hello? Quick question. Are the House of Darion samples ready to be shipped? So I'm headed that way now. Imagine a phone that is all music on one side and all talk on the other, just like you. Flip from your music to your life and perform the track at the 2006 American track at the 2006 American Music Awards, as well as various different shows. Irreplaceable is a mid-tempo ballad with pop and R&B influences and speaks of a breakdown of a woman's relationship with a man after she discovers his infidelity. This song was a massive hit and started the tradition for beat albums to have an iconic phrase, if you will. This iconic phrase being to the left, to the left, used as a pop culture reference to this day. The standard edition's closing track Resentment is a soul and soft rock ballad with gritty, agitated goodbyes, which adds a different kind of overwrought drama. Beautiful Liar, the opening track on the deluxe edition, and duet with Shakira, is an R&B and pop song. Lyrically, it speaks of two women who choose not to end their friendship because of a man who has cheated on the both of them. The main theme is female independence. The iconic video shows both B and Shakira mirroring each other. The fifth track on the deluxe edition, Welcome to Hollywood, is Beyonce's solo version of Jay-Z's song, Hollywood, on which she's featured. It's a disco-influenced R&B song which speaks of the tiredness celebrities sometimes feel. The song, Flaws and All, the seventh track, is an R&B trip-hop song on which Beyonce shows appreciation for the love given by her love interest, who sees her through all her flaws and loves her unconditionally. The deluxe edition also includes Listen, which appeared in Dreamgirls. It's a soul and R&B ballad and was called by its co-writer Anne Previn, a song on which the film's character Dina Jones, portrayed by Beyonce, is exclaiming, You don't know who I am. B-Day was a subject of various controversies. The music video for its lead single, Deja Vu, caused controversy due to its sexually suggestive content. A news article published actually reported that a particular scene in the video suggested oral sex. 
Natalie Moore of These Times, a blog site, added to the commentary, writing that the video showcases Beyonce strutting her sexuality, and that in Jay-Z scenes, it looks as if any minute now she's giving him fellatio, quote unquote. It's insane how risque grinding on a man was in 2006 compared to now, where it seems like there are no bounds to how sexually explicit you can be in, in a music video. The video later appeared on Yahoo Music News, lists Real Turkeys, the worst music videos of all time, which pointed to the negative fans' reactions and stated, it's probably the least horrific video listed, but as far as Beyonce videos go, it's a quote unquote stinker. According to MTV News Staff report, as of July 2006, over 2,000 people have signed an online petition addressing to Beyonce's record label Columbia Records, demanding a reshoot of the video. The 2000s were incredibly misogynist and racist towards black women, and many other pop stars around this time were harassed and mocked constantly by the media. By the end of August 2006, over 5,000 additional fans have signed it. The petition requested the video to be taped again because it was considered to be an underwhelming representation of the talent and qualities of the previous music video projects of Miss Beyonce, quote unquote. Included in the list of offenses toward the video were lack of theme, dizzying, editing over the top wardrobe choices and unacceptable interactions with Jay-Z and Beyonce, quote unquote. Or in other words, this is too complex for us to understand because we expect black women singers to be predictable and be pinned up brainlessly doing choreography in every video. Additionally, fans complain about sexual themes depicted in the video, describing that some scenes are unacceptable interactions between Beyonce and Jay-Z, while also complaining of the non-existent quote-unquote sexual chemistry between the two. As you can see, the Madonna horror complex that was expected of all female pop stars in, in the early 2000s was not coming off as genuine with Beyonce, which is why she had to abandon this image as this virginal figure in music. The real tea is that the lyrics of Ring the Alarm were rumored to be about Rihanna's relationship with rapper Jay-Z. According to the media speculation at the time, Beyonce, Rihanna, and Jay-Z were part of this love triangle in 2006. It was rumored that Jay-Z had always been faithful, faithful to Beyonce until he met Rihanna, whose popularity grew considerably during that year, and that she wanted Jay-Z to be in a romantic relationship with her while he was with Beyonce. As commented by Tom Braylon of The Village Voice, Beyonce took advantage of quote-unquote people's sympathy and unleashed a burst of public rage in the form of Ring the Alarm. In an interview for Seventeen, she however clarified the lyrics had no connection with Rihanna before adding that she was unaware of the rumors that had been circulating. A classic B move, if you will. Concerned that someone was trying to sabotage the release of B-Day, her father and manager Matthew Knowles released an official statement. It's apparent that there's a consistent plan by some to create chaos around Beyonce's B-Day album released on September 4th in the United States. First, it was a petition against the single Deja Vu, then a rumor regarding conflict between Beyonce and Rihanna, seizures caused by the Ring the Along video, putting, her, putting out a single to compete with LaToya's album, and now, to add to all of the ridiculous rumors, is my plan to postpone the release of her B-Day album. What will be next? Beyonce cuts off all of her hair, dye it green. Maybe she's singing the songs in reverse with some hidden subliminal message. Controversy also arose over the writing credits on Irreplaceable, Neo, who co-wrote the song, told NTV. Apparently, Beyonce was at a show somewhere, and right before the song came on, she said, I wrote this for all my ladies, and then the song came on. The song is a co-write. I wrote the lyrics. I wrote all the lyrics. Beyonce helped me with the melodies and the harmonies and the vocal arrangement, and that makes it a co-write meaning my contribution and her contribution made the song what it was. In 2011, Neo said that he wrote the song for himself, but he thought it would suit Beyonce better and later regretted giving the song to her. Some of Beyonce's fans read Neo's remarks as disrespectful towards her. However, he clarified his comments later through Twitter, saying, I said I originally wrote the song for me. Once I realized how the song came across, if sung by a guy, that's when I decided to give it away. In 2006, Beyonce appeared on billboards and newspapers across Australia, holding an antiquated cigarette holder. Taken from the back cover artwork of B-Day, the image provoked a response from the anti-smoking group, stating that she did not need to add a cigarette holder to make herself appear more sophisticated. In retrospective, 
These controversies now are obviously ridiculous by today's standards, with artists breaking this polished, refined image and having control on their own voices with the birth of social media in the coming years. It's actually amazing how she was able to evade this witch hunt in the music industry that was determined to break every woman in the pop music industry and succeeding with the likes of Britney Spears and countless others. Not Beyonce though. It's this part of her celebrity that intrigues me to be honest. The Beyonce experience was staged in support of B-Day and consisted of 96 shows in 2007 over five legs. The tour began that month and finished that November. Knowles collaborated with America's Second Harvest on the campaign for people who fought with famine and holding pre-concert food drives at every stop during the tour, asking for fans to bring food. Rehearsals for the tour began in March 2007, and the performances featured the music performed in an all-female band called the Sugar Mamas, chosen by Beyonce and her father, during the auditions held by the release of B-Day. The set list of the concerts included from B-Day, Jane Ashley in Love, 10 shortened versions of Destiny's Child songs, as well as listens originally recorded by Knowles for the soundtrack of Dreamgirls in 2006. 10 instrumentalists, 3 harmony vocalists, and 10 dancers backed Beyonce on stage, which also had disco balls hanging from the ceilings and color-changing stairs. An epic show indeed. For the looks of the legendary wardrobe of her tour, Knowles collaborated with several designers. It consisted of silvery and sparkly dresses which received praise from critics. If you want a two-hour nostalgia fest, I highly suggest watching. The crowd was also amazing. Beyonce has some of the most engaging crowds ever. They were hypnotized and in awe. Her stamina was amazing, hitting every note on time while in full motion. This would be the first of many subsequent film tours that complement each album with a live soundtrack. According to an editor of web publication The Boombox in the article published on September 4th, 2016, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the release of B-Day, the album was a monumental moment for music fans worldwide and would elevate Beyonce from princess-in-waiting to full-fledged queen in the music landscape. I completely agree. I feel like this album also expanded her fan base, allowing for queer people to also feel connected to this album, especially Black queer folks. The editor also called the album Beyonce's most liberating body of work and its impact still echoes 10 years later. In an article published by Revolt on the same day, B-Day was called Beyonce's first real visual album, as she would later release two visual albums, the iconic self-titled and Lemonade. And almost every song from B-Day had an accompanying music video, which was something we hadn't seen before. The same day, website established 1997 published an article about B-Day as well and wrote that the album's singles became essential parts of pop culture, also writing that Get Me Bodied is now cemented as one of those songs that gets played by a DJ to get a crowd dancing at a wedding. A true bop indeed. The website also wrote an article about B-Day's anthology video album on April 3rd, 2017, the 10th anniversary of its release, also calling it Beyonce's first visual album and stating that it laid the groundwork for Beyonce to become the pioneer visual artist she is revered to as today, hence this being considered her true first visual album. Billboard published Beyonce's best fashion moments from her decade-old B-Day anthology video album. On the same day, the list in which editor Deshaun Smith commented on the best outfits Beyonce wore in the video, stating the project has delivered audience some of the singer's most iconic looks. In every frame she appears in, Beyonce oozes a radiant confidence, wearing stunning outfits and costumes to match. Vibe published a list in which Smith ranked all 13 music videos from the worst to the best, stating B-Day video anthology album must be heralded as an important pop culture artifact. As expressed before, it's the birther of Beyonce's passion for providing fans visual sequences they need to tell an album's story. As we all know, B-Day is far from the peak of her career. I feel like B-Day was her flex era, where she showed the world how powerful of a talent she is from her dance capabilities to her vocal prowess. This project was her proclamation, her way of telling the world I'm creating my own lane, my own standard for which my predecessors look up to. What do y'all think? Leave a comment below. This era was strategic in making B the pop legend we know her as. In the next video, I'll actually be breaking down the era that cemented Beyonce as not just a cute pop girly, but a full-fledged entertainer and revolutionary performer, rivaling the very people she looked up to as a child. Right, um, a lot of you guys um, 
just got the call a couple days ago, and I know y'all had to drop a lot of things to, to come. And it, this wouldn't be anything without everybody here. And y'all are all here because y'all are special to Jane. Therefore, you're special to me. Anybody he loves, I love. Um, oh. This is it, nothing compared to what you've done. And not only me, but everybody here. You've taught me so many things. I was 20 years old when we first started dating. You taught me how to be a woman. You taught me how to live. You taught me how to be a friend. Um, you've given me so much in life. And this is, is not enough. It's not enough I can give you. I just want you to be happy. And every year, I'm even more in love with you. And I want to spend every day of my life with you. Happy birthday. The year is 2008. Crunk music is dominating the charts and the dance floors. Electro pop dance music is starting to wiggle its way up the charts. Rihanna just dropped her second studio album, Good Girl Gone Bad. And Katy Perry was kissing girls. Leona Lewis was bleeding love. No one knows that the sound birth around this time would start to take the industry by, by storm in the coming years, coming from the European nightclubs. You log into the video sharing service youtube.com and see Beyonce dropping a new video. Curious, you start the video and for the next few minutes, you are witnessing the birth of a new era in Beyonce's career that cemented her in the lanes of her idols. Beyonce became Beyonce the Machine, Beyonce the legend we know her for. This is I Am Sasha Fierce. I had some time to sit with Beyonce's latest album, Renaissance, and in doing so, I've concluded that Beyonce truly is probably one of the most innovative artists of the century. Through taking inspiration from the intersections of her identity and the identity of her fans, Beyonce crafts a holistic picture of how she views the world as a millennial black woman. She may rarely do interviews, but the music itself can be interpreted as her personal diary of her deepest thoughts. Today, me and you are going to explore it, the looks, the tea, and everything in between. Now let's get into it. I Am Sasha Fierce was released on November 12th. 2008 by Columbia Records and Music World Entertainment. In its original release, the album was formatted as a double album intended to market Beyonce's dichotomous artistic persona. Go through, I have two different sides to my, my personality and it's when I'm on the stage and it's who I really am. So I decided to, to give my fans what they want and what they're used to. Um, who is the person in all the videos and the person in Crazy in Love who is Sasha Fierce and I also wanted to introduce them to who I am and and um, give them a better deeper connection to my true feelings and and my sensitivity and, and my vulnerability the more mature I get the more I kind of use Sasha Fierce when I'm afraid or you know when I need to to be strong or, or a little more tough so I'm kind of merging the two together. So I named half of it I Am, and I gave them Sasha Fierce. So that's special for the fans. It's nothing new. It's something that, you know, my fans have for the past, I guess, six years been holding up the Sasha posters because they know that it's a transformation when I go on the stage. The first disc, I Am, contains slow and mid-tempo pop and R&B ballads, while the second, Sasha Fierce, named after Beyonce's onstage alter ego, focuses on a more up-tempo beat that blends electro-pop and Euro-pop elements. In composing the song's lyrics, Beyonce worked with writers with each session accompanied by a live orchestration. Beyonce credited both her husband, rapper Jay-Z, and jazz singer Edda James, whom she played in a biopic, for inspiring her to push the limits of her songwriting and artistry. Musically, I Am drew inspiration from folk and alternative rock, while blending acoustic guitar elements into contemporary ballads, and its tracks were written and produced by Beyonce. During collaborative efforts with Babyface, Tricky Stewart, The Dream, and Ryan Tedder, Sasha Fierce boasted production from Dark Child and Sean Garrett. The recording of the album took place over an eight-month period. Beyonce recorded the album in sessions at Bangladesh Studios and numerous other studios all over the world for privacy's sake. 
On the album, Beyonce either co-wrote or co-produced all of the material on I Am Sasha Fierce. She collaborated with several record producers and songwriters, including Babyface, Stargate, Tricky Stewart, The Dream, Dark Child, Sean Garrett, Solange Knowles, Jim Johnson, Rico Love, Ryan Tedder, Bangladesh, Ian Dinch, Dave McCarran, Wayne Wilkins, and Black Elvis. Beyonce also collaborated with musicians she had never worked with in the past, such as Toby Gad and BC Jean on If I Were a Boy. She also worked again with Amanda Ghost on Disappear. For the I Am Disc, Beyonce was influenced by folk and alternative rock genres while incorporating other instruments she had not normally used previously, such as the acoustic guitar. Tedder specifically assisted Beyonce with crafting the album's balladry. Ballads were all over the pop landscape thanks to acts like Adele and Leona Lewis, which were burgeoning artists at the time. The ballads were crafted in a way to combine the best elements of pop and soul while simultaneously expanding the possibilities of both genres. Beyonce attempted something different as people had strong expectations from her. She experimented with stronger lyrics. Beyonce worked with Ghost to rewrite Fran Schubert's Ave Maria after having co-written Disappear in London, England. Ghost told the Daily Telegraph that they were both inspired by their then recent marriages and had walked down the aisle to Ave Maria. The song Smash Into You, featured on the deluxe edition of the album, was originally slated to appear on John McLaughlin's sophomore album, OK Now, under the name Smack Into You, but was cut from the finalized track list after it was leaked online and subsequently given to Knowles. During the nine-month period between November 2007 in August 2008, Beyonce recorded over 70 songs and decided during the editing process that she did not want to reconcile the two approaches into one disc. If a song was meaningless to her, she would cut it off during the process of elimination for the final track list. After process of elimination, 12 tracks were selected to be placed on the standard edition of the album, while an additional five tracks were chosen to make the final cut for the deluxe edition of the album. Beyonce later revealed that the songs from established producers like The Neptunes and Donja were not able to make the final cut. The album was titled I Am Sasha Fierce to showcase the difference between Beyonce and her alter ego Sasha Fierce. The first disc is titled I Am, while the second is titled Sasha Fierce. Making comparisons to a magazine, Beyonce elaborated that the record was a double album and that, that it had two covers. The cover artworks for the standard deluxe and platinum editions of I Am Sasha Fierce were all shot by German photographer Peter Lindbergh. In a 2021 interview for Harper's Bazaar, Beyonce revealed that she based the entire project on black and white photography after being told in a meeting discussing analytics that research discovered that her fans would not like when her photography was black and white. She was not happy with this meeting, saying, it pissed me off that an agency would dictate what my fans wanted based on a survey. I'm so exhausted and annoyed with these formulated corporate companies. And highlighting the album's subsequent commercial success, in all honesty, the black and white theme of the album made the album seem like a vivid dream. Sidebar, the album actually gave me inspiration for my black and white thumbnails for my content. I also love black and white cinematography and photography as well. In an interview for Billboard magazine, Beyonce described I Am Sasha Fierce as a double album. She said one side had songs that were more mainstream and, the, and another had more traditional R&B songs for my fans who've been there the whole time. Some of it sounds like Barbara Streisand, Karen Carpenter, and the Beatles around 1970. Music writer Andy Cummin of All Music reviewed its first disc as essentially a small set of adult contemporary ballads, acoustic guitars, pianos, strings, contemplative soul searching, and grand sweeping gestures fill it out, with more roots in 1970s soft rock than soul. The second disc, Sasha Fierce, contains consistent electronic influences, which are displayed in songs like Radio and Sweet Dreams. Sweet Dreams is an underrated bop that echoes the electronic influences of single ladies. Kelman said in his review that Diva resembles B-Day's Freakum dress or Ring the Alarm in terms of audacity. Despite being on the Sasha Fierce disc, Ego, Why Don't You Love Me, and Scared of Lonely were noted to be a meeting ground between the album's two halves. As you see, this album was so thought out, and you really can tell in in this production. Beyonce is truly an album girl first, through and through. It's an art to her, not just a compilation of radio hits. The album formally introduces Beyonce's alter ego, Sasha Fierce. She revealed that Sasha was born during the making of her hit single, Crazy in Love. In an interview with Emmett Sullivan of People Magazine, Beyonce affirmed that her alter ego is strictly for the stage, with the editors describing Sasha Fierce as the singer's sensual, aggressive alter ego. 
Hello, my name is Beyonce. <laughs> Times are good for Beyonce. This weekend, she was named Best International Female at the World Music Awards, and she emerges triumphant in the Battle of the Divas after beating rivals Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera in the UK singles charts. Yes. I am Sasha Fierce. Tell me. Tell me more. <laughs> you have to say Sasha Fierce with more attitude. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, I decided to split the album into two because I realized it sounded like two two different bodies of work, and I, I wanted them both to be, you know, cohesive. And um, I I like to listen to uh, an album and not have to skip through tracks. So I split them into two. Even the artwork, one is really natural and it's really intimate and you know thought provoking and and emotional, more serious. And that's who I really am. And Sasha Fierce is kind of my alter ego on the stage, and it's like crazy in love and the the really sexy, fun, high fashion, um, kind of the it's like the personality I created on on stage while I'm performing. It's not like a usual pop video. It's, it's more not, like a short film. It is a short film, and actually Jake Nava, who's from from the UK, he he shot the video. He's so brilliant. Um, I remember speaking with him and, and I had an idea of what I wanted to do with the treatment and um, we kind of came up with no performance, just kind of acting out this little short movie and I, I wanted it to be black and white and really classic and uh, very emotional and I've been trying to do things that are different and not typical and things that, that are challenging for me just to keep this interesting for me because I've been I've been out since I was 15 now, so it's been 12 years, which is crazy. Um, but you know, it was great. I had the cop uniform, and when we were driving around, people were actually on the beating on the windows, like, you know, we need help, we need help. We're like, we're not cops, you know. But I, I was able to, you know, rough up a guy and handcuff him, and I felt hot. I loved it. <laughs> if I were a boy, the first single of I Am stands. As the only song on either disc, Beyonce did not co-write. BC Jean, who wrote most of the song's lyrics, took inspiration from a poor relationship. Beyonce explained in essence that If I Were a Boy is so different from her previous songs in the sense that it's not a traditional R&B song. Music critics remarked that the song seemed to be a, mix a mixture of her hit single Irreplaceable, Fergie single Big Girls Don't Cry, and Sierra single Like a Boy. And powers of the Los Angeles Times saw the song's theme of female empowerment an expansion on that of Irreplaceable. Halo, composed by Ryan Tedder and Evan Bogart, was initially intended for Beyonce, but almost recorded by Leona Lewis due to Beyonce's schedule. Imagine if Leona Lewis got Halo instead of Beyonce. It's crazy to think about. According to Christian Williams of Billboard, Halo has a mainstream pop sound with subtle R&B undertones. Ave Maria samples Fran Schubert's Ave Maria. Critics noted Diva as a variation of Lil Wayne's Amelie and coined it as its female counterpart. Diva carries a stuttering beat. Sweet Dreams was critically acclaimed for its use of electronic bass line, which some critics compared to Michael Jackson's Beat It because of its electro pop sound. Sweet Dreams is derived from the contemporary R&B and incorporates influences from classic 1980s funk. Broken Hearted Girl is a mid-tempo piano ballad. Its production and melody is backed by strings and drum machine beats. According to Spence D of IGM Music, Hello, my personal favorite ballad on the album, comes off like another ballad that populates the first part of the album. It contains the Jerry Mingerin line, You Had Me at Hello as part of its chorus, a beautiful ballad indeed. It essentially consists of sweet guitar picking and delicate harmonies. According to critics, Video Phone contains lyrics that are in reference to a celebration of Skype sex and putting on a solo show on camera for the guy you just met at the club. Listening to it in retrospect, you kinda can hear the time period it was from. Very late thousands. The remix version, ironically named Telephone, featured both Beyonce and Lady Gaga trading verses with one another. The video is such a great melding of two powerful women in the industry. Musically, the song consists of simple lyric with hidden innuendos. for at least being gutsy enough to get into a leotard and tights. I wouldn't do it, and you wouldn't want to see it if I did. Yeah, no. The president can do it, so can they. I don't think people understand how big of an impact this song and its video had on the industry from that point forward. This song was everywhere, 
on award shows, movies, radios, commercials, you name it. I was nine when this song came out. I remember being on YouTube seeing countless reactions of this dance by fans. Everyone from a white guy living in Illinois to a woman in Tokyo was doing that dance. Musically, Single Ladies is an upbeat dance pop and R&B song and features dancehall and bounce influences. According to Jonah Weiner of The Blender, the song makes a clear reference to marriage, while Greg Cott of the Chicago Tribune felt that the lyrics had a connection with post-breakup. Single Ladies was written by The Dream. The Dream conceptualized Single Ladies after Beyonce's secret marriage to hip-hop recording artist Jay-Z in April 2008. Stewart commented that the song was the only public statement that Beyonce and Jay-Z ever had made about their marriage and that while in a studio recording the song, Beyonce had remained tight-lipped, even to the point of removing her wedding band. Beyonce's marriage inspired the dream to compose the song about the issues that affect many people's relationships, the fear or unwillingness of men to commit. In an interview with Billboard magazine, Beyonce added that she was drawn to the song because of the universality of the topic, an issue that people are passionate about and want to talk about, and debate. She stated that although Single Ladies is a playful, up-tempo song, it addresses an issue that women experience every day. Single Ladies is musically similar to Beyonce's 2007 single, Get Me Bodied. Both producers Stewart and Harrell said in an interview given to People magazine that the similar rhythm of the two songs is what Beyonce responds to. Ann Powers of the Los Angeles Times saw the song's theme of female empowerment as an extension of that of Irreplaceable. The beat of Single Ladies evokes African gumboot dancing and schoolyard double dutch chants, a view shared by Douglas Wolfe of Time magazine. Tris Carford of the Toronto Star concluded that Single Ladies is a strong song of female empowerment. And other music critics have noted its appeal to Beyonce's fan base of independent women as in the song. Beyonce offers support to women who have split up from their no good boyfriends. <laughs> well, there's one thing that um, that you said when you accepted your award, uh, the record breaking award, and the whole world went <gasps> when you said, I love you to my husband, because you guys are so private, right? They're so private, which I think is the way to go when it comes to relationships in this business in order for them to survive. I'm very private about my life as well, that part of my life. Um, but. What made that come out? Because that usually doesn't come out. It you. usually doesn't. And you know, it's another reason why I wanted to run off the stage. I was <laughs> like, what did I just say? I, I, I had so many him. people. Yeah, they did. And he was like, he baby, was shocked. Like, we're not supposed to do that. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? But it was just a genuine moment. Uh -huh. And I looked in the audience and I saw my nephew and I saw my cousin Angie and I saw him. And it's the first thing that came to my mouth. And it, I... I didn't think about it, it just yeah. came out. And um, after I walked off the stage, I just bawled because that's oh. when I realized what just happened to me. Yeah. And everything I've been working for my whole life all paid off. Mm. That the song wasn't without critique and controversy though. I mentioned in a previous video how misogynistic and racist early 2000s and early 2010s media was. One harsh critique was made by a journalist at The Observer and he said, the album is too busy chasing radio formats to expose any genuine soul. And criticizing the second disc, he said, succession of independent women anthems such as Single Ladies and Diva, which with no doubt would inspire drag queens the world over, but leave most others bemused. Another journalist called its double disc a gimmick, flimsy, and favored its second disc, decent if easily forgettable upbeat pop. Wow, imagine saying a Beyonce album is unforgettable. This did not age well. A lot of the harsh critique of the album stems from the fact that this album appeals to mostly women and, and LGBT people. Female pop stars at the time had to fight to be seen as legitimate in the eyes of critics because their fan bases were always devalued due to them not being mostly white and straight. I'm kind of glad that critics for the most part have been sidelined for popular vote because the popular vote always wins in retrospect. Also, who can forget the infamous Kanye and Taylor Swift drama that was ignited after he stormed the stage after Single Ladies lost over Taylor Swift's album? This moment right here was the pop culture moment of the decade, with most people not knowing just how far Kanye would eventually take his antics. But Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time! Looking back at it, you can see the sheer terror and confusion in Taylor and Beyonce's face. I love them both, and I'm glad that they didn't let Kanye sour each other's views of each other. Also, I wanted to add, Beyonce never stole the choreography and has owned up to Bob.
During her performance, Beyonce did a cover of At Last, one of the most well-known songs by the late musician Etta James. And when James asked what she thought about Beyonce using the song, the gospel singer said she had a few choice words for the former Destiny's Child star that raised eyebrows and sparked a global celebrity feud. Barack Obama was sworn in as the 44th president of the United States on January 20th, 2009. That evening, Obama and his wife, Michelle Obama, attended 10 different inaugural balls. The neighborhood inaugural ball was the Obama's very first stop, where they did the first dance as president and first lady. The observers say that it was a stunning performance and that Beyonce got emotional as she sang. According to NME, Beyonce was so moved by the experience that she had tears in her eyes while, while she sang James's hit track. It wouldn't be Beyonce's last time performing for the Obamas. According to The Guardian, they also invited her to sing at his second inaugural ball, but her performance at the 2009 inaugural caught the media's attention, in part due to the reaction from Etta James. James is a gospel prodigy, reports Biography.com. According to the site, she has been nominated for numerous Grammy Awards and was also inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the early 1990s, so it only made sense that the media wanted to know what the Queen of gospel thought about the performance by Queen B, and James did not have nice words. During one of her performances at Seattle's Paramount Theater, The Guardian reports that James made fun of Obama's big ears and said that he wasn't her president. She said, he might be yours, he ain't my president. But James didn't just criticize Obama, she also critiqued Beyonce singing her song at the inauguration. She said, I tell you that woman he had singing for him, singing my song, she's gonna get her behind whoop said James in a Guardian story. And she wasn't done. The publication said she continued saying, the great Beyonce, I can't stand Beyonce. She, as you can see, she did not like this at all. And I, I don't want to call her jealous because Etta James had, had has had one of the most legendary careers to ever exist. She, however, is a culmination of her experiences being a woman who suffered from abuse in the industry. The backlash she received from her statements, she later recounted her statement saying she was not serious when she said those statements. So we can leave it at that. Entertainment Weekly ranked I Am Sasha Fierce at number two on her list of 10 best CDs of 2008, stating that If I Were a Boy and Single Ladies are undoubtedly album highlights. Still, the surprise here is how consistently satisfying the rest is. Even the less showy tracks blossom on repeated listen. About.com ranked it at ninth place on the list of best R&B albums of 2008. NBC Washington placed I Am Sasha Fierce on the list of honorable mentions while writing the list best albums of 2008. CBN News and Current Affairs recognized I Am Sasha Fierce as the 12th best-selling album of 2008. On the Village Voices, Paz and Jop year end list, I Am Sasha Fierce was ranked at number 333 and 580 in 2008 and 2009, respectively. The album was ranked at number 12 on the list of the best albums of the 2000s decade in Rolling Stone's Reader Poll. The writers of Entertainment Weekly ranked I Am Sasha Fierce as number 8 on their list of 10 best albums of the decade. I Am Sasha Fierce won a Soul Train Music Award for Best Album of the Year at the 2009 Soul Train Awards. Beyonce won American Music Award for Favorite Soul and R&B Artist at the American Music Awards in 2009. Beyonce also won a BET Award for Best R&B Artist at the BET Awards in 2009. However, she lost the same award to Alicia Keys at the following ceremony. Similarly, Beyonce was nominated for a Brit Award for International Female Solo Star at the 2009 Brit Awards, for a Media Music Award for Best International Female Artist at the 2009 Media Awards. I Am Sasha Fierce was nominated for the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Album at the 40th NAACP Image Awards in 2009, and for NRJ Music Award for International Album of the Year at the NRJ Music Award in 2010. Beyonce was also nominated for a People's Choice Award for Favorite Female Artist and Favorite R&B Artist at the 36th People's Choice Awards in 2010, as well as winning a Teen's Choice Award for Choice Music and being nominated for World's Best R&B Artist at the 2010 Music Awards. I Am Sasha Fierce and its singles earned Beyonce seven Grammy nominations and at the 52nd Annual Grammy Awards in 2010, including Album of the Year. She won Record of the Year getting six Grammy Awards out of seven and an award for her rendition of the classic Etta James song, At Last, from Cadillac Records' soundtrack. 
I Am Sasha Fierce ended up being Beyonce's greatest work yet, giving her that one in a generation artist title. However, Sasha Fierce had its downsides. Because Beyonce was so good at convincing the public of the split persona, she and others like her, like Gaga and Nicki, started to face backlash, and their alter egos ended up overshadowing their humanity, making them almost into caricatures. Beyonce did not want to keep this image, and knowing this, she killed Sasha Fierce and started peeling back the layers of her true being. Are you filming me? I'm gonna show you in a minute. You're filming me with that? Okay, I think the car is pulling up. We had a fantastic show in DC. Four shows in a row. You can only imagine how exhausted we all are. And I'm here on the couch in my sweatsuit with a very sweaty face, eating salty lace potato chips. And I just had Cheetos, which I haven't had in so long. And they taste heavenly. I want a pickle and jalapenos and it's one in the morning so my mother's passed out and i felt like i deserved a nice snack so i'm eating ways and drinking some type of fruity drink that tastes like pure sugar it's great Beyonce the megastar became Beyonce the wife and mother after the death of Sasha Fierce and I feel like shedding this alter ego allowed her to grow as an artist. However, because of how explosive I am was, Beyonce had very little time to devote to her personal life, causing her to take a full year off. Next episode, I'll talk about Beyonce's transitional period where she was in the awkward but liberating stage in her career where she finally took full control over her music and image. Four was released on June 24, 2011 by Parkwood Entertainment and Columbia Records. Following a career hiatus, this reignited her creativity. Beyonce was inspired to create a record with a basis in traditional rhythm and blues that stood apart from contemporary popular music. It was a transitional period in her music where Beyonce was trying to find a sound that truly felt authentic to who she is as a woman in her 30s. Her collaborations with songwriters and record producers The Dream, Tricky Stewart, and Shay Taylor produce a mellower tone, developing diverse vocal styles and influences from funk, hip-hop, and soul music. Severing professional ties with father and manager Matthew Knowles, Beyonce went against the music of her previous releases in favor of a more intimate, personal album. Four's lyrics emphasize monogamy, female empowerment, and self-reflection. In May 2011, Beyonce submitted 72 songs to Columbia Records for consideration, 12 of which appeared on the standard edition. Four was promoted in mid-2011 by television performances and festival appearances, such as Beyonce's headlining of Glastonbury's festival set. Following the release of her third album, I Am Sasha Fierce, in 2008 and a world tour, Beyonce took a career hiatus in 2010 so she can live life to be inspired by things again. Is, I love to perform. I love music. I love what I do. I love singing in the studio and writing songs and coming up with video treatments to the point that during that year, I do not count the 72 songs I recorded as work because it's what I was born to do. And I learned balance. I learned the importance of taking time for myself. And um, I was moving around so much that I had no idea that I really have 16 Grammys. Like I, I, I've heard that and I, got up and accepted my awards, but I didn't realize what an amazing accomplishment that you was. You never had time, presumably. No. It's just this treadmill. Yes. The more successful you get, the less time you have to enjoy anything. Exactly. So finally you went, enough. I'm having a year out. I'm going to enjoy what I've achieved and a better real life. What was the, what was the most fun you had in the real world? Um, well, I, I, I did everything, you know. I definitely enjoyed the simple things like, you know, driving and picking my nephew up from school, um, traveling but not working and actually visiting museums and seeing ballets and um, 
having great during her hiatus she killed sasha fierce the alter ego she used in previous studio albums as she felt she could now merge the two personalities she also severed professional ties with father and manager matthew knows who had guided her career since the 1990s with destiny's child noting that the decision made her feel vulnerable having to balance the two is really hard and really making sure that i'm still doing my job which is to be the performer and the entertainer and not have to do everyone else's job so that it, mine doesn't suffer. That's been, that's been a challenge, but I, I'm having a great time and I'm sleeping with my Blackberry. I'm having dreams that I'm answering emails, like it's that far, but it's gonna slow down <laughs> and I'm really learning and hopefully I'll inspire other artists to take control and hopefully I'll be able to pass my wisdom on to younger artists. Beyonce also recounts in her documentary, Life is But a Dream, it damaged her relationship with her father. In an interview for Complex, Beyonce expressed dislike for following contemporary radio. She intended for it to help change the status, saying, figuring out a way to get R&B back on the radio is challenging. With 4, I tried to mix R&B from the 70s and the 90s with rock and roll and a lot of horns to create something new and exciting. I wanted musical changes, bridges, live instrumentation, and classic songwriting. On her website, she wrote also, the album is definitely an evolution. It's bolder than the music on my previous albums because I'm bolder. The more mature I become and the more life experiences I have, the more I have to talk about. I really focus on songs being classics, songs that would last, songs that I could sing when I'm 40 and when I'm 60, end quote. The landscape before streaming was very, very different. Contemporary radio was king and dictated what most artists at the time released. Beyonce also sought to make more artistic music rather than purely commercially oriented songs. Although much of Ford's inspiration came from touring, traveling, watching rock bands, and attending festivals, the album's early music direction was influenced by Nigerian Afrobeat musician Fela Kuti whose passion for music motivated Beyonce. You can hear the Afro influences in the album. Some songs even fit perfectly on Beyonce's collaboration album, The Gift. Uh, uh, but I like the idea of this, uh, this album. You took your time with this one. You took a year off. I did. And you just did fun stuff. I did. I did not put any limitations. I didn't put, you know, I didn't even say I'm going to do any specific type of album. Just I just nothing. did whatever I loved and I was inspired by so many different travels and types of music that I was exposed to, going to watch my sister DJ and you know, going to some of the festivals and watching my husband perform. And I was really inspired by um, Africa and, and Fela Kuti and jazz and I kind of mixed everything together and came up with Fine. my own little genre so I'm proud of this well album. congratulations number one of course Thank I you. mean well, number four is the name of the album but it was number one there you go so <laughs> she worked with the band from Fela the Broadway musical based on Kuti's life DJ Swivel one of Four's engineers later described how Kuti's use of percussion and horns influences the track End of Time. End of Time is one of my personal favorite songs by her and this era in general and gives me that warm feeling of nostalgia. In 2015, The Dream revealed that he and Beyonce had composed a whole album based on Kuti's music, although this was scrapped in favor of creating Four, therefore explaining how End of Time became so heavily influenced by it. She also found additional influences in Earth, Wind and Fire, the stylistics, Lauren Hill, Stevie Wonder, and Michael Jackson. She used hip hop for a broader sound and looked to bring soul singing back, stating, I used a lot of brassiness and grittiness in my voice that people can hear in my live performances, but not necessarily on my records, end quote. Only a mere three months into her break from music in March 2010, Beyonce began recording at her husband Jay-Z's Rock Nation Mike Studios in New York City. One song, Party, was recorded because she wanted to see what working relationship she could develop with the engineer, DJ Swivel. Kanye West also assisted the production of Party after Beyonce was impressed by his work on My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, released in 2010. Andre 3000, the only featured artist on 4, contributed a rap verse to this song, which he recorded in Georgia. Six weeks later, in May 2010, she asked Swivel to work on the entire project. Concerning his working relationship with Beyonce, Swivel commented, There was no, we're doing this today. It was a very kind of open project. Whatever she felt like recording at that time was what we work on. It was based on how she felt, her mood, and also listening to the demos that writers would give us. With Swivel, she experimented with horns, 
drums, guitars, and percussion instruments. Swivel began to formulate beats using their own recordings and those from Fela. The project was then moved to KMA Studios for a week and a half because Rock, the mic was not large enough. There, they began recording the song I Care, The Best Thing I Never Had, Rather Die Young, and Completed Party. They recorded the song School in Life 1 Plus 1 and Start Over at Jungle City Studios in New York. MR Studios was the final New York City-based studio used and where most of 4 was recorded. Only Party and I Was There was recorded entirely in other studios. At MSR, Beyonce emphasized the use of live instruments on the songs on songs such as I Care and End of Time. Consequently, most of those instruments, including drums, keyboards, guitar, and bass work, were recorded there and performed by Jeff Basker and Shay Taylor. Beyonce also asked Frank Ocean to write and record I Miss You at MSR. I was in the car and my husband was playing uh, this, this music and this guy's tone and his lyrics just touched me and after one song I said okay who is that <laughs> because I want them on a flight tonight and he told me it was Frank Ocean and I immediately reached out and he came in the next day and we did like five or six songs and he is just so humble such a nice person really really talented very fast he just has so many ideas and um it's great because he's an artist and I can't wait for everyone to hear him because he's just the truth. After listening to each song, Beyonce would often request the additional of specific instruments, leaving her production team to make the sounds cohesive. Her vocals were recorded through an Avion Design 737 preamp and compressed in an 1176 peak limiter with a four to one ratio. After recording the lead vocals for the track, Swivel cut them in different ways, and he and Beyonce picked the best, then recording the back vocals. Beyonce compressed her own vocal arrangements and harmonies for each song. Her microphones were carefully placed to achieve a blend of sounds with clear quality. In my opinion, her vocal peak was this album. Songs like Love on Top and Countdown show her progression from the I Am era perfectly. Even with up tempos, you can see her evolution from Euro dance pop to a more Afro dance sound. Swivel also spoke of her work ethic in, in an interview for Sound on Sound, saying, She's so fast and good at what she does, you can't afford to waste time on anything. So we're ready to record drums, for example. We're going to work with whatever we have available right then and there. That's why we worked in such great studios, because we know they have great gear we know we don't have to worry about renting gear. Part of my job as an engineer is to make to make sure the sessions are not only moving along, but moving along at her pace." End quote. After the move to MSR, Beyonce and her production team began traveling. In the United Kingdom, they worked at Peter Gabriel's Real World Studio in Wiltshire, particularly using Gabriel's multi-instrumental room to create Love on Top. Soon after, Beyonce joined Jay-Z in a Sydney mansion as he was working on his collaboration album, Watch the Throne, in 2011 with Kanye West. There, they created a primitive studio using a microphone, a rig out, and Pro Tools software to record. Sessions were also held in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Honolulu. In February 2011, MTV reported the project was nearly completed, or was mixed mostly at Mixstar Studio in Virginia and mastered at Sterling Sound in New York City. The audio mastering was delayed by a week following the unexpected recording of I Was Here. Diane Warren had played the song to Jay-Z during a telephone conversation, leading him to put Warren and Beyonce in contact. It was the last song I did. I was actually, I was somewhere outside of New York. I remember getting, oh, I was doing Oprah, actually. I was filming Oprah, and I got a call from Diane, and she played the song on the guitar over the phone. And I said, oh my God, I have to have this song. And it was inspired by 9-11, and it's the 10th anniversary, and I thought, wow, this really completes my album and gives it so much heart. Well, because 
For one, I usually have dreams about my performances and I have visualized everything from the color of my stiletto to my hairstyle to the choreography and movement and no one has seen it except me. So there are certain details that I'm really specific about and it's, it's hard for me to commit to something until I have that vision because I haven't seen it yet. It's very strange, but all of my really great performances, I, I saw them happen before they, they happened. In May 2011, Beyonce submitted 72 songs in preparation for the album's release. According to Swivel, an eclectic range of songs, including ballads, quote unquote, weird ethereal things, and 1990s R&B and Afrobeat inspired songs. The final cut of four comprises 12 tracks on the standard edition and 18 on the deluxe edition, three of which are remixes to Run the World Girls. Critics reviewed four as a major departure from Beyonce's previous catalog with a distinctive mellower sound. The album consists mostly of mid-tempo R&B songs with 1970s funk, 1980s pop, and 1990s soul influences. The second half was more eclectic, exploring a variety of genres, including hard rock, reggae, and adult contemporary. The album complemented the album's divergence from the layering of Eurosynths on pop beats that characterized the music of Beyonce's contemporaries. The balladry in the first half of four combines diverse vocal styles with the use of live instrumentation. One plus one demonstrates Beyonce's vocal flexing over a magnificent guitar bombastic and soft backing beats. While Start Over, a mid-tempo R&B ballad uses a futuristic beat with electronic elements and synthesizers, I Miss You, with its layers of atmospheric keyboards, ambient synthesizers, and tiny 808 drums, was sung in half whisper to exhibit intense emotion. I Was Here, an understated pop R&B ballad with indie rock inflections, primarily concerns self-reflection with dramatic vocals. On other songs, Beyonce explores womanhood. Best Thing I Never Had, Four's fourth track, was described as a moment of self-realization and a female call to arms with vocals that, that alluded to a wounded bird turned resilient lioness. The song is built on a piano riff and beefy bass drums. Dance For You conveys a more sexual tone through breathy vocals and blaring electric guitars. It foregoes her typical empowerment themes in favor of sensual imagery and comfort in one's partner. Run the World Girls, a female empowerment anthem reminiscent of Beyonce's more contemporary work on I Am Sasha Fierce, uses an energetic sample of Major Lazer's Pond the Floor. The song incorporates layered melodics, most prominently a military marching drum beat, while Beyonce's near chanted delivery encompasses her full vocal range. Beyonce viewed Countdown as one of her most experimental songs, using a variety of genres, including dancehall, it features a brass arrangement. Beyonce sings the chorus, a countdown from the number 10, with a sample of Boys to Men's Ooh Ah. The tracks Countdown and End of Time were distinguished by their music, musical and lyrical experimentalism, and honestly, are the two songs that are still on my playlist to this day. Countdown was described as an everywhere on the genre map, although predominantly dancehall led with a bristling brass arrangement. Its chorus describes a relationship by counting backwards from 10, using a sample. End of Time's pulsating brass sounds, reminiscent of a marching band, was heavily influenced by Afrobeat musician Fela Kuti. Kuti's use of horns and percussion instruments was recreated and combined with elements of electronic music and synthesizers. Other tracks were noted for their retro stylization. Rather Die Young is a throwback to 1960s doo-wop and Philadelphia sound with a slow tempo and modern drums. The song Party achieves a vintage aesthetic through minimalistic production, replete with heavy synthesizers and 1980s smooth funk groove. The song is unique for its conversation-like structure in which Beyonce and guest vocalist Andre 3000 sing verses that allude to socialization at parties. Elements of Prince's style was also found on Schooling Life and One Plus One. Schooling Life is an up-tempo funk song with lyrics that advise the listener to live life to the fullest while cautioning them about the consequences of their excess. The chorus of One Plus One was compared to Purple Rain with themes of sadness and resentment. The song uses soft background vocals and dense percussion. The song Love on Top was noted for its energetic key changes with joyful tone, evoking the work of Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson. Its retro sound is marked by a melding of horns as well as sweet backing harmonies that are most prominent on its bridge and chorus. Beyonce is known for being an incredibly private celebrity. 
and has throughout her career been able to keep up this aura of mystique even in the age of online oversharing. From her marriage to Jay-Z to her announcement of her first pregnancy in 2011, she always managed to be able to surprise the world in just a few seconds. Beyonce's onstage pregnancy reveal at the 2011 VMAs was an unforgettable moment in pop culture history. Her mother, Miss Tina Knowles Lawson, who famously designed performance outfits for her daughter for years, opened up about the fashion feat of Beyonce's baby bump reveal. Miss Knowles Lawson was responsible for styling Beyonce in ways that would cover up her growing bump on stage. This was stressful, especially with so many eyes watching. And Miss Lawson recounts the night saying to page six, well, this was a stressful night. At least it began that way. Two hours before the performance, we realized that the pants that I had gotten were too tight and uncomfortable. The panel that I had just put them in were not stretchy enough. With no time to spare, Mama Tina headed to the nearest maternity store. Two hours before the performances, I was at pee in the pot, she continued. I bought two sizes in maternity pants, but wound up taking the panel off of one of them and putting the ones that I had made. Luckily, the last minute DIY worked flawlessly. When she opened up the jacket and showed her stomach, it was the biggest relief ever, Nose Lawson recalled. We didn't have the keep the secret anymore. I didn't have to design with the first priority being to camouflage the growing belly. It was the best feeling in the world to see her show the whole world that tummy. To belt out love on top at the VMAs a decade ago and show everyone she was pregnant with her daughter Blue Ivy, Beyonce paired the stretchy pants with a purple sequin Dolce & Gabbana blazer, a white button down shirt, and platform heels. The baby bump wasn't without controversy though. Looking back at this actually made me slightly uncomfortable. If you haven't already guessed, I'm talking about the conspiracy over B's baby bump being fake. Everyone from Wendy Williams to TMZ was covering the story, causing it to morph into a PR nightmare with Beyonce having for the first Time publicly defend herself and her family from these attacks. It was around this time, also, she completely stopped doing televised interviews. Just take a look at the video. Okay, so here's Beyonce and she's walking out and everything is fine. She's five months pregnant. Then she sits down and what that is, B? <laughs> well, look, Beyonce has den denied these rumors saying that they're stupid and they're ridiculous. And, you know, they've, they've also been uh, words that, well, she took a picture in a bikini, it's on the internet. Okay, take a look at the picture. Okay, be very clear. Then I'm pregnant too. I mean, all right, here's some alleged conspiracy theories. Number one, the baby is helping Beyonce's sagging recording career. It is sagging. I mean, the statistics show, but you forget all about that because you're so focused on, oh, Beyonce's pregnant. Number two, these are conspiracy theories. Beyonce's pregnancy is a way of keeping Jay-Z's alleged, alleged mistress away. You know, this is, what I, this is what I love. This is what I love about this show. You can't see everything that I can see, but people are snapping their necks in naudation. How about this one? How about this one? The alleged woman over in allegedly Trinidad with the alleged 10-year-old alleged son allegedly by Jay-Z. Beyonce's trying to keep up with her, allegedly. And how about this? And this is the most disgusting one. Beyonce's gonna use a surrogate so she can maintain her body. I don't believe that one. Well, here's one that's even more disgusting than that. They're adopting, but she, they're gonna play it off like. Let me explain what went down. When Beyonce was pregnant with daughter Blue Ivy Carter, rumors began to spread that one, she faked a pregnancy with a prosthetic belly, and two, she enlisted a surrogate to carry the child. In an interview with People Magazine in 2012, the 16-time Grammy winner and People's Most Beautiful Woman said, addressing the rumors, that it was crazy, it was hurtful, it was just crazy, where did they come up with it? In October 2011, Beyonce shot down speculations as stupid, ridiculous, and false through her publicist after a video of her interview with the Australian talk show Sunday Night HD fueled fake bump chatter when her stomach appeared to deflate on camera. She said, it was the fabric that folded. Does fabric not fold? Oh my gosh, so stupid, she said. Meanwhile, Mama Tina took the talk personally. She said, I thought it was very unfair and very cruel that someone would think that someone would be so diabolical to keep up a charade like that for nine months. As a mother, it was painful for me to hear the crazy rumors and I even had people ask me, which was so ridiculous. What is insane to me is that in doing research for this video, I found it super interesting how the media landscape has evolved over time when critiquing celebrities in just a few years, especially if they're women. In 2011, it was considered quote unquote vain or narcissistic for a woman to have a surrogate. It was that stigma that was so venomous about these rumors. It wasn't just a fun 
known conspiracy, these rumors had real life consequences for Beyonce and other celebrities. And also, unfortunately, Beyonce did experience a miscarriage in her pregnancy before Blue Ivy. This completely devastated her and she also recorded a song that she never released to get out her emotions. wasn't enough for us to survive I swear, I swear, I swear I tried You took the life right out of me I'm so unlucky I can't breathe You took the life right out of me Me, 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 me I'm longing for your heartbeat Heartbeat, heartbeat now, in 2023, surrogacy is not looked at with such tone deaf judgment. It is now understood that not all women experience fertility in the same way and shouldn't be judged by their method of having children. Now we could move on. Glastonbury in 2011 was nothing short of a masterpiece. Anyone who was there will agree to this, and to this day it remains one of the great Glastonbury headlines performances of all time. Now, let's take a look back on why B's booking was so controversial at the time. Cast your minds back to 2011, when Beyonce was booked to headline Glastonbury for the first time. I wasn't kidding when I said they were watching me make my, my well, this night was a dream. You and said you were a rock star. I felt like a rock star. <laughs> and the crowd, they looked like rock stars, and I, I'm just so honored, really. It, it, this is like a highlight of, of my career, and so I was able to see my husband performed here a couple of years ago and I it was one of the most exciting nights for me and I just I, I don't know if I would have been asked to come if, if he didn't do the performance and I, I'm so happy because you know this is I don't normally do festivals and 175,000 people and I was very nervous and everyone gave me so much love and the two previous years of Glastonbury have seen headline slots from Neil Young Bruce Springsteen, Blur, Gorillaz, Muse, and Stevie Wonders. So Beyonce was to become the first solo female artist booked to headline the festival since Sinad O'Connor in 1990. With her performances, Beyonce also became the first solo black female artist ever to perform at a headline set on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury. It was great. And what about the stage set? Because that was absolutely spectacular from the very first fireworks to, by the end I was thinking that, that pyramid was reminding me of George Clinton's mothership. I was kind of getting, <laughs> I was getting parliament exactly. by the end of the set. There was a little bit of everything in there. I wanted to bring some that. funk and some soul and I was standing on the pyramid stage and that's actually, I know it's very literal, but that's what gave me the idea. I saw the stage and I thought, you know, I had such a wonderful time in Egypt and it was really impactful and inspired a lot of my music. So I said, let's do a, a really nice pyramid in the back. Keep it simple. B's husband, Jay-Z, had controversially headlined Glastonbury two years before in 2009. With, mo with many people claiming that it wasn't a rapper's place to play a headline, Beyonce booking at Glastonbury was also met with some discourse from festival goers, with many disappointed to see an R&B star given Glastonbury's much coveted closing spot on the festival's Sunday night. But let's be real. 
They were so mad that a black woman at that was chosen to headline. It had nothing to do with her being an R&B girl because by the time 4 came out, Beyonce had numerous songs that traversed genres. Beyonce, in my opinion, is a genreless artist. Not many artists outside of maybe Michael Jackson or Whitney Houston have this title. Nine years ago today, Beyonce headlined Glastonbury. She was pregnant at the time with her first child, Blue Ivy. But as she always does, Beyonce put on a show to remember and her Glastonbury 2011 performance will go down in history books as one of the greatest ever. At the time, she even broke the record for most television views for a single performance, according to the BBC. Beyonce at Glastonbury is 90 minutes of pure B greatness, with classic hits such as Crazy in Love making the cut, whilst B even found time to perform some of her hits with Destiny's Child, including Bootylicious and Say My Name. Four received positive reviews from most music critics. At Metacritic, which assigns weight meaning ratios out of 100 to reviews from mainstream critics, the album received an average score of 73 based on 36 reviews. Michael Craig of The Observer called it Beyonce's most accomplished album yet. Slant Magazine's Eric Henderson believed Force succeeds vocally as an album of mostly intimate and slow tempo ballads. Michael Wood of Spin Magazine's applauded its ballads, mid-tempo songs, and evocation of late 1970s and early 1980s pop soul. In his review for Rolling Stone, Jody Rosen wrote that Beyonce eschews contemporary production styles for a more personalized and idiosyncratic album. The New York Times viewed it as a good showcase for Beyonce as a torch singer because she convincingly sings about heartbreak and the strong emotional effect of love. Pitchfork critic Ryan Dumble found it easygoing, retro-informed, and engaging because it shows one of the world's biggest stars exploring her talent in ways few could have predicted. All Music's Andy Kelman said that the quality of Beyonce singing and the songwriting compensated for the assorted arrangement of the songs. Uncut viewed it as an exceptional album in spite of in spite of occasionally trite lyrics. In a less enthusiastic review, Adam Markovit of Entertainment Weekly said that the first half of four is marred by boring ballads and the songwriting in general are not on par with Beyonce's vocal talent. In his review for The Guardian, Time Magazine said that the songs lack lyrical substance, even though they were performed well. Greg Cott, writing in the Chicago Tribune, called for inconsistent, short, and unfinished. NME Magazine felt Beyonce did not progress from her past work and that even the OK bits sounded quote-unquote uninspired. A critic named Tom Hall was more critical and gave the album a C, lamenting the, the second half of the song's overkill production and believing the first half's ballads show that while every soul diva of her generation has dream of singing like Aretha Franklin, only Beyonce has the ego to think that she's done it, quote unquote. So was for a commercial failure? The short answer to that question is yes and no, and I'll tell you why right now. It's yes because Beyonce is viewed more as a brand, and because of this, her numbers are expected to reflect that of a global superstars. In those terms, Ford did underperform. However, I say no because a flop for Beyonce is most people's peak. It's all relative. In the United States, Ford debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, with first week sales at 310,000 copies. This gave Beyonce her fourth consecutive solo album to debut at number one on the Billboard 200 album chart, making her the second female artist after Britney Spears and third artist overall, tied with Spears and DMX, to have her first four studio albums debut atop Billboard's 200. Four's first week sales became Beyonce's lowest sales, starting with a studio album to date. All in all, I think Four is an amazing album. It ignores the dominant Euro pop sound that has essentially hijacked radio at the time. The best pop stars like MJ or Madonna or Beyonce make pop music that is both commercially viable and critically laudable. What seems to be missing from Fora's unique composition is a radio hit. Run the World killed it at the clubs, but it went nowhere on the charts. And 1 plus 1 is absolutely gorgeous, but it essentially is hookless, which was critical for radio success at the time. The ballads also lacked instant gratification of Adele's Someone Like You or Gaga's Edge of Glory. I put this in here to say 4 was not a bad album. It's far from a bad album, but for a Beyonce album, 4 was not the most successful. However, I think this era was necessary for Beyonce to collect data on what her fans really want from her moving forward. Her next project would prove to be a legendary moment for the industry as Beyonce completely left the pursuit of radio and harnessed the power of social media to craft a visual album that laid the foundation for Beyonce's music to reach a younger generation, Gen Z. 
It is this era where my generation gravitated towards her because of her realness and willingness to be more open with her fans through music. In this album, we see a real unedited version of her music. Beyonce, for the first time, let her artistry reflect her mind as it is and not a curated version to be palatable for the mainstream crowd. This album was a love letter to her fans. So stay tuned for the next video where I talk about the era that made me fall in love with Beyonce all over again. Surfboard, surfboard. <laughs> People don't make albums anymore. They don't make albums. They just try to sell a bunch of little quick singles and they burn out and they put out a new one and they burn out and they put out a new one. People don't even listen to a body of work anymore. I don't know about y'all, but it seems like everyone remembers where they were on December 13th, 2013, when Beyonce dropped Self-Titled. Like we were sharing in the same brain cell that day or something. But like so many other Beehive members, I too remember where I was the exact moment it dropped. On my way to the hospital to see my late grandfather and was casually scrolling through Instagram and saw my timeline flooded with pink text saying the word Beyonce. Curious, I went straight to YouTube and was baffled seeing 17 videos all there at once on her channel page. The first video I saw was Drunk in Love and it was the moment where I knew Beyonce was evolving into a completely different artist, a new artist. This was the moment I fell in love with her all over again. This was the Beyonce that ignored the haters and made art she really wanted to make. This was her liberation from the shackles that keep most music artists in bondage for years. Nothing like this has ever been done so smoothly like this rollout. Beyonce broke just about every rule in the music biz and changed the whole game. She did all of this without a single leak. Self-titled is Beyonce's fifth studio album. The record was released on December 13, 2013 by Parkwood Entertainment and Columbia Records. Developed as a visual album, its songs are accompanied by non-linear short films that illustrate the musical concepts conceived during production. In my opinion, this was not the first time she did this. Watch my previous videos on B-Day if you're confused, but this was the first time that she created something that reflected her personality in all its messy bits. This project was unique for Beyonce because of its shadowy, intimate subject material reflecting her personal relationship with her husband Jay-Z. It includes feminist themes of sex, monogamous love, and relationship issues, inspired by Beyonce's desire to assert her full creative freedom. This project was when we saw the raw, unedited Beyonce for the first time, and it was legendary. Also, this was the first time we start to see Beyonce's political beliefs be reflected in her artistry, this being feminism. Prior to self-titled, Beyonce had just completed possibly the best live performance she has ever done. The Super Bowl in 2013 gives me chills to this day. The album's initial recording began in New York City, where Beyonce invited producers and songwriters to live with her for a month. During extensive touring the following year, the album changed as she conceived of creating a visual accompaniment to the songs and resumed recording sessions with, with electronic producer and rock musician Boots. Their collaboration led to more sonically experimental material which combined contemporary R&B with electronic and soul music. Throughout this period, the album's songs and videos were composed in strict secrecy as Beyonce devised an unexpected release. Beyonce was released digitally on the iTunes store without prior announcement or promotion and debuted at number one on the US Billboard 200, earning Beyonce her fifth consecutive number one album. The album's initial recording began in New York City, where Beyonce invited producers and songwriters to live with her for a month. During extensive touring the following year, in an interview on Vulture.com, New Culture Podcast N2, host Sam Sanders had a discussion about the business of Beyonce with music journalist Danielle Smith, former editor of Vibe and Billboard and host of podcast Black Girl Songbook. On an episode titled The Business of Beyonce, Smith said, and it was such a cosign, if you really think about it, of social media. It was a star of her stature basically saying, this is where my fans are. This is where the conversation is. This is where the real and new marketing is happening now. This was back when Beyonce had only 8 million followers. Everyone else was pretty traditional. Very few artists or label had gotten that something was going to have to change. Right now, if you look at the media plan or marketing plan or an album release plan, the first sentence, if not the first words, are going to be about social media. But back then, that still wasn't the case. People were still talking about breaking songs on the radio. No one wanted to believe in 2013 that social media was going to be social media. It was changing everything but so many label professionals, so many radio professionals, so many singer-songwriters just didn't want to believe it was going to be anything but a side dish. As we know now, it's the main
Danish. Beyonce knew that and took advantage of that early on. Smith also talks about how much control record labels had on releases prior to social media being used as a tool for marketing, saying, yes, there used to be so much more control from the labels. People used to sit up in marketing meetings, a full room of 15, 20, 30 people listening to a song from Beyonce like artists and just go around conference tables and decide what the single was. That literally just doesn't happen anymore. And Beyonce is a huge part of that, end quote. In my personal beliefs, I feel like artists now are still slaves to their recording contract. And now record labels know the loopholes that prevent a lot of artists from pulling a Beyonce. I feel like Beyonce was able to accomplish this on a part of her managing herself and founding Parkwood. This is kind of similar to when Taylor Swift bought back her masters or when Michael Jackson bought the Beatles. It was a power move. And a lot of the greats tend to do this when they build a reputation in the industry for being a powerhouse and global brand. In mid-2013, a relatively unknown artist, Boots, signed a publishing deal with Jay-Z's Rock Nation. In an interview for Pitchfork after the album's release, Boots was coy when answering questions about how Beyonce discovered his demo or his work previous to the project, only confirming his signing. In June 2013, they met in person for the first time, and Boots presented Beyonce with material he felt would resonate with her. However, Beyonce was interested in his experimental material, and he reluctantly played her his song called Haunted on his cell phone. She refused to ignore its potential. At a later meeting, he played her a stream of consciousness rap called Ghost, which he wrote after an exasperating meeting with potential record labels. Boots began by composing a melody that reminded him that reminded him of a hypnotic state, then laying guitar arpeggios to resemble the work of English electronic musician Affix Twin. Subsequently, Ghost became the first half of Haunted. He later described Beyonce as the only visionary in the room for her ability to find potential in scrap songs. Following these sessions, Boots would go on to work on 80% of self-titled. While Recording in New York City, the previous release, Bow Down, was incorporated into a track that became flawless. During its composition, Beyonce chose to interpolate a portion of Chimanada Ngozi Adichie's TED Talk, We Should All Be Feminist. We teach girls to shrink themselves, to make themselves smaller. We say to girls, you can have ambition, but not too much. You should aim to be successful, but not too successful, otherwise you will threaten the man. Because I am female, I am expected to aspire to marriage. I'm expected to make my life choices, always keeping in mind that marriage is the most important. Now marriage can be a good thing. It can be a source of joy and love and mutual support. But why do we teach girls to aspire to marriage and we don't teach boys the same? We raise girls to see each other as competitors, not for jobs or for accomplishments, which I think can be a good thing, but for the attention of men. We teach girls that they cannot be sexual beings in the way that boys are. Feminist, a person who believes in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. This was the song that had some of the girls in their feelings, with R&B star Keisha Cole having a critique of the lyrics, Bow Down Bitches. Beyonce had this squeaky clean feminist image that often meant she was pigeon-held into saying certain things to appeal to that aesthetic, but not with this project. Her profanity in this project was necessary to tell the world, hey, I'm a grown-ass woman and I will say what I want. Organic approaches were taken when writing and recording Drunk in Love and Partition. When working with the detail and Timbaland on the beat that became Drunk in Love, she was inspired by what she described as pure enjoyment as both she and Jay-Z freestyled their verses for the track in the studio. I um, kind of freestyled the, the verse. Drunk in love. And Jay went in and he just started flowing out his verse. We just kind of had a party. See all the shit that I heard. No, I slim Clint Eastwood. Hope you have handle this curve. Oh, go back to East Eastwood. No, uh, handle this curve. Come on, slim Clint Eastwood. Halfway there, my G. Another round of that do say we dare. And then Timbaland. Similarly, the baseline for Partition, which Beyonce found reminiscent of hip hop music during the early romances with her husband Jay-Z, influenced her to accompany the track with sexual lyrics. She took the microphone without pen and paper and rapped the first verse, finding herself initially embarrassed by the explicitness of the lyrics. I was so embarrassed after I, I recorded the song because I'm just talking shit. 
And I'm like, I can't play this for my husband. I still haven't played it for my mom. She's gonna be very mad at me. When composing Partition, a rap known as Yonce was used as the opening of the track, the beat of which was built by Justin Timberlake's banging on buckets in the studio. I really find information like this very interesting because it just shows how random the creative process really is. Only four songs were recorded entirely in New York City, Superpower and Heaven, which were partially recorded in California, as well as No Angel, which was composed in London, and EXO in Berlin and Sydney. Although the demo of EXO was recorded when Beyonce had contracted a sinus infection, the vocals were never re-recorded as she felt their imperfections would fit more appropriately. In October, the album began taking shape and Standing on the Sun and Grown Woman were removed, songs which had been previewed in 2013 on television advertisements. Standing on the Sun could have easily been in the standard edition. It's one of my favorite songs from her ever. It's almost like a mature grown woman version of Baby Boy, especially the remix version. During Thanksgiving week, the vocals on the album were edited and producers were notified to submit their final cuts. Beyonce spent less time on the vocal production than she had done with her previous projects, instead focusing on perfecting the album's music. Self-titled was mastered at Sterling Sound in New York City. In total, 80 songs were recorded for the album. Beyonce first considered the idea of creating a visual album in June 2013, when only three or four songs had been completed. Explaining her motivation, she said she would often connect images, childhood memories, emotions, and fantasies to songs she was in the midst of composing, and that she wanted people to hear the songs with the story that's in her head, as that's what makes it hers. She highlighted that the immense experience of Michael Jackson's thriller as the principal influence for creating a body of work that people would hear things differently and actually be able to see the whole vision of the album. The videos were filmed between June and November 2013 in various countries as the singer traveled for her world tour. Todd Torso, who directed the videos for Jealous in Heaven, served as the creative director for the entire project. Much of his role concerned liaising between Beyonce, who for most videos already had concepts, and the respective directors who also had propositions. Like I previously mentioned, most videos were shot outside the US. The crew surrounding the videos was small, consisting of only Torso, the director of photography, and producer, as well as Beyonce and her stylist, makeup artist, and security. When filming in public, Beyonce would wear an in-ear headphone instead of having the music played out loud in order to maintain the secrecy of the project and prevent any songs leaking. Torso commented that she would rewrite some lines or she would add certain audio or she would add bridges and believe that it would complete the picture of where the audio needs to go. Several videos were intended to demonstrate the album's central theme of finding the beauty in imperfection. While working on Flawless, Beyonce was reminded of her loss on the television competition Star Search as a child, which she saw as a defining moment in her career and believed that the competition had taught her how to embrace imperfection in the future. The theme was represented in the videos by the recurring use of trophies. The singer saw as referencing all the sacrifices that she had to make as a child. It also carried into how the visuals were created, with the videos for Drunken Love, Yante, No Angel, XO, and Blue shot with without prior preparation, as the singer found enjoyment in the spontaneity of filming locations and in resisting the urge to perfect them. Interesting, the last few videos, we've been like deciding what we're gonna do as we're there, and there's something about that freedom that it's different for me because I usually plan things and I'm trying to rebel against perfection. It's, it's fun because you just never know what's going to happen. Noting some of the visual explicit content and exposure of her body, Beyonce says she found shooting them liberating and expressed her intention to demonstrate sexuality as a power that women should have, and not losing that after becoming a mother. She went on saying, I know finding my sensuality, getting back into my body, being proud of growing up, it was important to me that I expressed, I know that there are so many women who feel the same way. Being proud of growing up. It was important to me that I expressed that in this music because I know that there are so many women that feel the same thing after they give birth. You can have your child and you can still have fun and still be sexy and still have dreams. I met this girl named Nikki. I guess you could say she was the rap queen. I met her in the studio lobby, but her booty looked bigger in the magazines. She said, B, will you jump on this song of mine? How could I resist when I heard little Nicky rhyme?
Before releasing her second single, Anaconda, on Sunday, August 3rd, 2014, Nicki Minaj surprised the Barb's when appearing on the remix to Beyonce's Flawless. Late Saturday, August 2nd, 2014, Beyonce dropped the remix to the self-titled song without notice, while some outlets predicted a collaboration between the two superstars was coming. It was mostly kept under wraps until the final week of it. Nicki Minaj called into Hot 97 on Monday morning to share how the remix came to be, and Minaj said, A month ago, G called me when I was on the way to Vegas and said, Beyonce wants you to remix to Flawless. After I got proper medical help and started breathing again, I was like, what? She sent me a version that she wanted. She told me, I want you to be you. I don't want you to hold back. I said, you sure? She said, yeah, I want you to be you. Do you? I was actually in New York writing the verse. I recorded the verse in New York and she stopped by the studio. She was such a sweetheart. She was hyping me up. Do your thing. Don't hold back. Go in. I was like, okay, all right. She continued. Yeah, this is Beyonce. And just to know that she recognizes my talent like you know she's been someone that i looked up to for so long i told her this and she always shares like her own great thoughts and you know she teaches me so much and she's always um complimenting me about something and imagine meeting like someone that you really really look up to and they're complimenting you on your craft since they met up at the New York City studio, Nicki Minaj has been sending B photos of herself for the single artwork. The single cover features a collage of selfies of both. She said she was going to drop it in the middle on the run tour. I wrote the verse before she even went on tour. We've been going back and forth. I've been sending her photos of myself. We've been going back and forth about the mixes and the single art. And now, here you have it. Nicki Minaj revealed that while she remixed Beyonce stuff in the past, such as her remix of Sweet Dreams and Single Ladies featuring Lil Wayne, she almost thought the collaboration between the two would never happen. She said, when I was putting out mixtapes and stuff, I would remix her stuff. I have a dope remix that my fans have always been in love with. I figured that eventually we would do something together. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Recently, I thought it would never happen. I felt like if she was gonna ask me, she would have asked me already. I think the stars align the right way. We are just in the right places in our careers that it makes sense now. With the release of her last album, her records are geared to what I do now. In my opinion, Flawless solidified the union between the Barbs and Beehive permanently because of this collaboration. This iconic iconic song showed that two powerful black women in the industry can collab and create masterpieces together. Self-titled is a 14-track set with 17 short films, a video for each audio track, two extra videos to accompany the two-part tracks, Haunted and Partition, as well as a bonus video for Grown Woman, which lacks an equivalent audio counterpart. Departing from the traditional R&B leanings of its predecessors for, the songs are predominantly alternative R&B. Hence, musically, the album may be located in the post-dubstep era, fusing electronic music with R&B and soul reminiscent of artists like The Weeknd. The album's dark, moody production is more textured than previous releases, and songs are characterized by heavy bass and loud hi-hats, as well as prominent synthesizers. The album adopts unconventional song structure. Many songs emphasize moody, shifting beats and drawn-out vibe sessions, and are left to slowly unwind. This is particularly prominent on Haunted and Partition, which function as two-part suites. The ethereal state created on Haunted is ushered in with the stream of consciousness rap entitled Ghost, which transitions from a smoky ether reality to an off-kilter club beat. In my opinion, Ghost is one of those songs that would do well even if it was released in 2023. Amid a shifting bass line and ghostly keyboards, the track Partition begins with Yonce, a slick rap set over a simple Middle East rhythm. The song is divided by a brief interlude loot of camera clicks and the whirring of a car window before launching into the second half that melds synthesizer pulses with finger snaps to create a southern hip-hop bassline. Over this, the song follows a candid narrative that describes sex in the back of a limousine when traveling to a nightclub. Both Yonce and Partition are some of my favorite tracks off the album, especially when this first dropped. I learned the lyrics to Yonce in like a week. Several critics noted the album's extensive exploration of sexuality and feminism. Having been a singer since the age of nine, Beyonce felt stifled by the perception she was a role model for young children, and now in her 30s, she believed that she earned the right to express any and every side of herself. Beyonce was famous since she was a teenager and she felt like her core fan base was evolving and maturing just like she is and wanted her music to reflect this change. Addressing the album's sexual content specifically, Beyonce said, I don't at all have any shame about being sexual and I'm not embarrassed about it and I don't feel like I have to protect that side of me. 
end quote. Several critics describe Beyonce's sex songs as a celebration of monogamous love. Drunken Love is a duet with her husband Jay-Z and features lyrics heavily laden with double entendres and that explore lust within their sexual relationship. It fuses intermittent trap beats with heavy bass, skittering synthesizers and drums, and Arabic scale vocal arpeggios. Beyonce's vocals are diverse, including a melodramatic chorus sung in her upper register and half-wrapped second verse. Blow veers from the thumping jazz beat created with the sparse piano chord and guitars to swing electro-funk groove with elements of neo-disco. Its erotic tongue-in-cheek lyrics include running cunnilingus metaphor of licking skittles and its chorus. The slow jam rocket is a homage to D'Angelo's soul-infused untitled How Does It Feel released in 2000. It's a slippery six and a half minute funk excursion. Beyonce adopts a slow harmonious vocal as she instructs her love interest to watch her perform a strip tease. Beyonce's self-titled album features themes of feminism and gender issues with a particular focus on black female sexuality. The song Flawless includes a speech by Chimadaza Ngozi Adichie on the socialization of girls and Beyonce's own reflection on feminism and misogyny. Other songs in the album address themes of fidelity, personal insecurities, self-empowerment, and harmful beauty standards. Beyonce's vocals on the album range from half-rapped to half-sung to full-sung and include the use of falsetto and head voice. The song XO employs echo in call and response techniques, while the closing track Heaven and Blue are mid-tempo with gospel and piano elements. Heaven is an emotive hymn and Blue is a love song to Beyonce's daughter, Blue Ivy Carter. I felt like I don't want anybody to give the message when my record is coming out. I just want this to come out when it's ready and from me to my fans. Throughout 2013, Beyonce worked on the project in strict secrecy, sharing details of the album with only a small circle of people and continually shifting the deadline, which was only finalized a week before its release. She later explained that her intent was to reinstate the idea of an album release as a significant, exciting event that had lost meaning in the face of hype created around singles. Torso and his small team of designers were tasked with designing Beyonce's album cover, which he found difficult considering it was a visual album and thus inundated with imagery. Over three months he considered over a hundred options only to proceed with his very first idea. He was inspired by the cover of Metallica's fifth studio album released in 1991 to create a bold statement specifically to deviate from a beauty shot of Beyonce which he felt would be expected. They use a font similar to play cards used in boxing matches to represent abrasive masculinity which was contrasted by the grayish pink font which they described as a subversion of femininity. In early December 2013 Beyonce and her management company Parkway Entertainment held meetings concerning its release with executives from Columbia Records and the iTunes store using the code name Lily for the album. Meetings were also held with Facebook executives in regarding to advertisement that resulted in the album benefiting from the social network's then new autoplay feature for videos. On December 9th, 2013, Rob Stringer, chairman of Columbia Records, knowingly told media that the album would be released at some point in 2014 and would be monumental. On December 13th, 2013, the album was released in the early hours of the morning without any prior announcement or promotion exclusively on the iTunes store. The singer commented that she was bored of music being marketed as it had been done previously and wanted its release to be a different experience for her fans. Follow the rules and we said why can't we do it? You know I said to so many people I have an idea to do a visual album and I want to and I was like <laughs> okay and we did it. Like I said, the album was available exclusively on the iTunes store until December 20th, 2013, when physical copies were distributed to other retailers. Then reported that American retailers Target and Amazon Music refused to sell the physical copies of the album. After the album's release, Beyonce performed EXO during the remaining stops on the North American leg of the Miss Carter World Tour in December 2013. In early 2014, she performed Drunk in Love for the first time at the 56th Annual Grammy Awards on January 26th. EXO's first televised performance was at the 2014 Brit Awards on February 19th. All the music videos from the album were screened at the 2014 Los Angeles Film Festival on June 13th, along with commentary from three of the video's directors who were present at the ceremony. To further promote the album, Beyonce embarked 
on her first co-headlining stadium tour with Jay-Z. The On The Run tour, which was legendary, kicked off in Miami on June 25th, 2014 and ended in Paris on September 13th, 2014. Drop a comment if you would like an OTR deep dive. Pre-recorded performances of Partition from the tour was broadcast at the 2014 BET Awards on June 29th. Beyonce performed a 16-minute melody of the album songs at the 2014 MTV Video Music Awards on August 24th. On December 12th, 2014, just about a year after the release of Self-Titled, a short film entitled Yours and Mine was uploaded to Beyonce's website and to YouTube. I sometimes wish I could just be anonymous and walk down the street just like everyone else. The entire black and white spoken word film, which features behind the scene footage and repurposed imagery from the music videos of Self-Titled, was described as a retrospective short film celebrating the one year anniversary of the Self-Titled visual album. I always consider myself a feminist, although I was always afraid of that word because people put so much on it. Two lead singles were released from Self-Titled. EXO impacted contemporary hit radio in Italy and hot adult contemporary radio in the United States on December 16, 2013. The following day, it impacted urban contemporary and contemporary hit radio stations in the United States. EXO peaked at number 45 in the US Billboard Hot 100 and reached the top 20 charts and around and reached the top 20 in charts around the world. Accompanied by the release of EXO, the other lead single Drunk in Love was serviced to urban contemporary radio stations in the United States on December 17, 2013. It peaked at number 2 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the US Hot R&B, Hip Hop Songs, and Rhythmic Charts. Drunk in Love also peaked at number 7 in New Zealand. The song was certified platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America, denoting sales of 1 million digital copies. Partition impacted urban contemporary radio in the United States on February 25, 2014. At the album's third single, it peaked at number 23 on the US Billboard Hot 100 and number one in the US Dance Club songs. On April 24th, 2014, the music video for the fourth single, Pretty Hurts, was made available for streaming via Time Magazine's official website to accompany Beyonce's feature as one of the world's most influential people. The song impacted contemporary hit and rhythmic radio in the United States on June 10th, 2014, and contemporary hit radio in the United Kingdom on June 23rd, 2014. Flawless was released as the fifth and final single from the album. Its remix featuring Nicki Minaj was released on August 12th, 2014. Self-titled received widespread acclaim from music critics. At Metacritic, which assigns a weighted mean rating out of 100 to review from mainstream publications, the record received a high score of 85 based on 34 reviews. Critics genuinely commended the album as thematical and musically bold, as well as emphasizing its visual aspect and surprise release. Many said it was her magnum opus of some sort. Pitchfork calls self-titled MJ-level talent met pop perfectionism in a moment that defined album cycle disruption and a victory lap be as pop feminism's reigning goddess. The album's exploration of sexuality was particularly well received by reviewers. The New York Times described the tracks as steamy and sleek, full of erotic exploits and sultry vocals, noting that every so often for variety they turn vulnerable, compassionate, or pro-feminist. The 405 characterized Beyonce as a feminist text. They noted that the tracks demonstrate Beyonce's desire to retain complete sexual agency, while also foregoing the expectations of pop songcraft by placing female pleasure at the forefront unquestionably. Pop Matters praised the album's honesty, high sexual nature, observing it was her first attempt at bridging an audience, making music that makes the men want to hear what she has to say, and the women feel like they can say it to men as well. A very interesting take indeed. I feel like this album's content can be quite engaging for a male audience compared to her previous work. Other re 
reviews recognized that the album eschewed contemporary R&B in, in favor for more experimental compositions. Pitchfork writer Carrie Baden of the same publication wrote that Beyonce was exploring sounds and ideas at the grittier margins of popular music and rejecting traditional pop structures in favor of atmosphere. Atmosphere, I feel, is a trend in modern music to this day. Its origin started around 2013, 2014. If you don't believe me, listen to like most albums released last year and you'll probably feel like this atmospheric feeling in most of them, especially in projects like SZA's last project. NME believed that the low-key moody production throws the spotlight on the words and the images brought to play and described it as her most experimental work to date. Rolling Stone found Beyonce's boldness among its best attributes, believing that the album is at its strongest when it goes for a full grown electro soul with an artsy boho edge. The Los Angeles Times highlighted a desire to push creative boundaries among the tracks and admired how the music similarly blends the intimate and the extravagant, while Entertainment Weekly concluded that the album was characterized by clashing impulses between strength and escape, megapop and fresh sounds, big messages and resonant lyrics. Praise was reserved for Beyonce's vocal performance. The Telegraph's Neil Cormick declared Beyonce as one of the most technically gifted vocalists in pop favoring her gospel power, hip hop flow, and huge range. He was particularly complimentary on the vocal restraint displayed across the tracks that was absent from her previous releases. The Observer noted the diverseness of her vocals on the album's up-tempo songs and found the singers ranging between squeaky sexed up falsettos, hood style rapping, and wordless ecstasies of effortless swoops. Despite being released in December when several publications had completed their year in list, self-titled was ranked the best albums of the year by Billboard. As of January 2015, Billboard also named Beyonce as the second best album of the first half of the 2010s. The Guardian included the project at number 9 on their ranking of the 100 best albums of the 21st century. Self-titled also included the 2016 update of the 1001 albums that you must hear before you die. Consequence of the Sound named the album 37th best on the last 15 years. The album was nominated for five Grammy Awards at the 57th Annual Grammy Awards in 2015, including Album of the Year, Best Urban Contemporary Album, Best Surround Sound Album, and Best R&B Song and best R&B performance for Drunk in Love, winning the latter three. In recreation of the infamous incident at the 2009 MTV Video Music Award, Kanye West briefly appeared on stage during the presentation of the Album of the Year Award to Back Morning's Phase in 2014, released in 2014, in protest of Beyonce not winning again. While it initially appeared to be a joke as West returned to his seat, as West returned to his seat, he said in comments following the ceremony, that Beck needs to respect artistry and he should give the award to Beyonce. He later apologized for his comments. At the 2014 MTV Video Music Awards, Beyonce was presented with the Michael Jackson Vanguard Award for her work on the visual album, performing a 16-minute melody of its songs. Van Tofer, president and CEO of Viacom, noted that their choice for the Vanguard Award was influenced by this project. The album was nominated for World's Best Album in 2014. It also received two nominations at the 2014 Billboard Music Awards for Top Billboard 200 Albums and Top R&B Album, while Drunken Love was nominated for Top R&B. It won the category for Album of the Year at the 2014 Soul Train Awards and Favorite Soul R&B Album at the American Music Awards of 2014. The album sold over 600,000 copies in the United States in its first three days of sales, be becoming the fastest selling album in the history of the iTunes store up to that point. According to the International Federation of Phonographic Industry, Beyonce was globally the 10th best selling album of 2013. The album was reissued in November 2014 as, as part of the Platinum Edition, along with an extended play of new songs and has sold over 5 million copies worldwide. Part of the album was promoted on the Miss Carter World Show Tour in the 2014 legs. According to Billboard, as of 2022, Beyonce is one of the 15 best performing 21st century albums without any of its singles being number one hits on the Billboard 100, which is actually a really good feat. The surprising release of Beyonce caused reaction among fans, successfully recreating the hype of album releases that she felt was needed in the industry. This shock among other musicians, in effect coined as the Beyonce syndrome by the BBC, according to data provided by the release generated over 1.2 million tweets in 12 hours. Rolling Stone wrote, the whole project is a celebration 
of the Beyonce philosophy. The BBC said Beyonce's self-titled album not only proved innovative musically, it rewrote the business model of the industry. Forbes included self-titled in their music industry winners list in 2013, noting that the singer didn't make use of any of the perks of being signed to a large record label. The machine we are told that is so necessary. There was no radio promotion, no single, no advanced press of any kind. The marketing strategy of releasing an album with little or no notice was a subject of case study at Harvard University School of Business. Beyonce is credited with the popularization of the surprise album and the act of releasing a project without prior announcement has subsequently been executed by many other artists including Drake, Kanye West, Kendrick Lamar, and Eminem. This came at some downsides though, where some artists with young or very small fan bases expect the same reaction that Beyonce did when she dropped self-titled. To their disappointment, many have flopped trying to recreate this. The artist and rapper Saweetie is one of the music artists that comes to mind recently dropping a surprise project that did more harm than good for her career. Time Magazine named Beyonce one of the most influential people of 2014 due to the album release. Writing, in December, she took the world by surprise when she released a new album, completed with videos, and announced it on Facebook and Instagram. Beyonce shattered music industry rules and sales records. However, this is not the last time Beyonce shocks the world. Amidst national efforts to curb police brutality in America, Beyonce the artist used her global recognition to start highlighting facets of her identity as a black woman. The year 2016 proved to be the year Beyonce took a stance politically and socially. And moving forward, her subsequent projects have been linked to the issues and the lifestyle that black people all over the world have and face. This is also the time when Beyonce enters her first real scandal. Her marriage struggles birth a new type of Beyonce, one who's not shying away from her truth. Stay tuned for the next video where I deep dive into the era where Beyonce the artist became Beyonce the activist and black feminist icon we know her for today. Peace out. So to understand this era, we have to go all the way back to its alleged origins. I'm going all the way back to arguably Beyonce's first real scandal where the fourth wall was broken. Her pristine celebrity reputation was the stuff of legends. No arrest, no baby father drama, no patty drama with other celebrities or family scandals that actually affected her career. That is until one night in 2014 at the Met Gala after party. Surveillance video showed Solange and Jay-Z getting into an argument as Beyonce witnessed the incident in an elevator following the after party. The footage showed Solange yelling at the rapper before it wildly hitting and kicking him as Julius tried to restrain her. At one point, Beyonce stepped in to stand between her husband and sister. The surveillance video was obtained by TMZ and widely circulated. Although nothing has been confirmed, sources told E! News that the fight was the result of some alleged drama involving fashion designer Rachel Roy. The E! News source claimed that Roy, who used to work at Jay-Z's company Rockaweer, had allegedly gotten a little too flirty with the rapper earlier in the evening, causing Beyonce to approach Rachel to let her know that the behavior was disrespectful and she wanted her out of their lives for good. Solange came over to have her sister's back and things got heated with her and Rachel. Jay said some disrespectful things to Beyonce and Solange as the confrontation was going down. That's why all hell broke loose in the elevator and that's why Beyonce just stood back and let Solange hit Jay. Ten days after the incident, the trio released a joint statement addressing the drama. They said, as a result of the public release of the elevator security footage, there has been a great deal of speculation about what triggered the unfortunate incident. But the most important thing is that our family has worked through it. They said in a statement to Associated Press, Jay and Solange assumed their share of responsibility for what has occurred. They both acknowledge their role in this private matter that has played out in the public. They both have apologized to each other and we have moved forward as a united family. The statement continued, the reports of Solange being intoxicated or displaying erratic behavior throughout that evening are simply false. At the end of the day, families have problems and we're no different. We love each other above all else. We are family. We put this behind us and we hope everyone else will do the same. Two months later, Solange cleared the air about the altercation with Lucky Magazine. She said, what's important is that my family and I are good. What we had to say collectively was in the statement that we put out and we all feel at peace with that. Beyonce kept talk of the incident alive in August 2014 when she debuted a remix to her song Flawless that seemed to reference the famous elevator brawl. And honey, this became the pop culture moment of 2014 with Halloween costumes being based on this incident and it even was featured in a parody on Family Guy. Because the elevator footage did not have audio, the entire internet tried to piece together their own conspiracies about what exactly happened that night. Now with
with us sitting here in 2023, nearly a decade later, we for the most part are well aware of what happened. So much has happened since then. And Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Solange have drastically evolved artistically and just as people in general. Beyonce is now a mother of three and has completely rebranded herself as an artist who is dedicated to showcasing the beauty of black people from all across the diaspora. This hasn't always been the case though. There was a brief moment in time where Beyonce's blackness was tested and challenged because of her privileges associated with her light skin and vague racial ambiguity. Beyonce has never denied being a black woman. However, many people have brought up that she was at one point the palatable blackness that mainstream culture can handle. I would say it started around B-Day and her respectability era peaked around the end of I Am Sasha Fierce era. So many thought pieces have been written on Beyonce's hair and the symbolic nature of her choosing to sport blonde hair. Black thought leaders such as the late great Bell Hooks is noted for critiquing the nature of Beyonce as an idolized image of black womanhood, not as a person necessarily. Bell Hooks has a bit of a history with Beyonce actually. In 2014, she drew criticism for saying that Beyonce's image is anti-feminist and a terrorist for young women. This was due to her status as a modern day sex symbol that was ultimately determined by the white male gaze. Numerous black scholars have come out with similar critiques, especially during her I Am era. Eventually with all the criticism and backhanded remarks from black scholars and the black community about her allegiance to blackness, she decided to pick a side publicly, politically, and socially. Her Super Bowl performance in 2016 was the declaration of her blackness, similar to when she declared herself a feminist during the self-titled era. Beyonce not only claims her blackness, she is also politically aligned with it. This was crucial because around this time was the start of the modern Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of black music artists were very vocal about police brutality, and Beyonce saw this as her chance to let the world know that even though she's a global superstar, she's still a Southern black girl at heart. Her ancestors loved, triumphed, and died on the soils of the Southern United States. And as a black American person with family roots in the Southern United States, I cannot tell you how important it was seeing Beyonce start to shine a light on the beautiful complexities of black American culture. Of course, many artists have been politically and culturally conscious before. This isn't an entirely new concept. What made Beyonce different is that she essentially did a 180 on the world's expectations of her as an artist on her level. It's expected for black folks to politically distance themselves from blackness once they enter a certain economic class in order to keep their positions of power. But the thing is, by this time, Beyonce and Jay-Z have amassed an empire within music and pop culture to where they no longer had to play the game. They can put the middle finger up to respectability and have nothing to lose. She brought blackness to the stage and has not let up since. Beyonce caused quite a bit of controversy for performing her new single Formation at halftime for the 50th Super Bowl and the most watched television event of the year in the United States in February 2016. According to The Guardian, the Formation song was criticized by right-wing parties and former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and they labeled the song anti -post Police. She was also criticized for aligning with the Black Lives Matter movement and using the Black Panther Party symbol in her dance routine. A day before her performance, she released an unannounced new single with a politically charged video, which was also performed at the Super Bowl. Formation was described by Mike.com as one of the most political videos in recent memory during the time. In the video, she was seen lying atop a New Orleans police car that sinks into the water, referring to Hurricane Katrina, which ravaged mainly black communities in 2005. With reference to the Black Lives Matter movement that details what it is like to be black in the United States in 2016, her lyrics said, I like my baby hair with baby hairs and afros. I like my Negro nose with Jackson 5 nostrils. While Formation was part of her performance in the Super Bowl in 2016, she made several references based on the black activists and black lives movements from the past. During the dance performance, the singer and the backup dancers raised a fist in the air mimicking the Black Power salute by Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City. In some parts of her performance, Beyonce and the dancers formed an arrow, straight lines, and a triangle shape, but it was the X shape that gained people's attention. The shape referred to Malcolm X, the Black civil rights leader who was assassinated in 1965. Although it was not part of the performance, one of the pictures of Beyonce's dancers surfaced from backstage, in which they held a picture with the the slogan justice for mario woods on it which referred to the one who was shot dead by police in san francisco at the 2016 super bowl host city beyonce's low-cut leather outfit was also criticized for not being family friendly enough for the biggest football game of the year and her performance was said to have some sexual innuendos in it too child the karens had a field day with this performance lemonade is arguably the first project where beyonce showed herself in a more emotionally erratic and vulnerable state i feel like her work before lemonade always had an air of dignity and piousness that gave her that 
that no-nonsense feminist image. Who cares about men and their BS when girls run the world, right? The boss babe feminist image started to become exhausting. Beyonce wanted to let the world know that she is human just like you and I. She has bad days and sometimes she misses her man and sometimes she wants to throw him off a building. That's normal in love. It fluctuates with time. Beyonce has always had songs about the topic of heartbreak, but not in regards to her personal life. She always would have a disclaimer that the subject of these songs has nothing to do with her personal life, with certain songs especially during the Dangerously In Love era, where even then people thought she was talking about Jay-Z. You can tell in her early songs that naive, almost childish innocence that most young women have at the beginning of their adulthood until the rose-colored glasses are lifted and you see love for what it actually is hard work. Her album 4 and her following project self-titled, we see a, a slow unraveling of this idolized version of love that so many of us have in our minds in our early 20s. Lemonade is different because she's not trying to project like she has it all together in this project. We get the impression of purposeful messiness from the vulgarity of her lyrics to her facial expressions and dreamlike imagery. We get a sense she is delivering a message that only those interested will decode. In this section of the video, you and I are going to decode this message as it pertains to her relationship with her husband and how she was able to express this visually and musically in her film Lemonade. Lemonade essentially is a tale of heartbreak and triumph. The album and its visuals allude to the 12 phases of making Lemonade, which shows how Beyonce handled or imagined to handle infidelity, including intuition, denial, anger, apathy, emptiness, loss, accountability, reformation, forgiveness, resurrection, hope, and redemption. I'll be citing the article Beyonce Got It Right, Cheating's Emotional Fallout Gushes from Lemonade, written by Laurel Gegel. In this article, the author explains how Beyonce was able to heal by going through these 12 phases. In intuition, Beyonce asks, where do you go when you go quiet? What are you hiding? Her intuition tells her that something is wrong, and she sings about how she prays to catch him whispering and I pray to catch me listening. Many affairs are discovered because of careless clues and intuition. People may start questioning themselves, wondering, is this really happening? They may also question the partner saying, I feel like something is going on. Denial may follow with some people thinking, my partner would never do that to me. They may also deny they were victimized and instead blame themselves for their partner's transgression. Beyonce's denial has a hint of self-blame. She says, I tried to change, tried to close my mouth more, tried to be soft, prettier, less awake. But her anger is quick to follow. I am the dragon breathing fire. She sings and don't hurt yourself. Beautiful mane, I'm the lion. Beautiful man, I know you're lying. I am not broken. I am not crying. I'm not crying. You ain't trying hard enough. You ain't loving hard enough. You don't love me deep enough. Beyonce really owns her anger, but anger is usually a frustrating stage, especially for women. And because she is a black woman, she looks to her foremothers for the answers because of infidelity a lot of older generations of women had to put up with. Her own mother had to deal with infidelity in her marriage to her father. And the hip hop of black fathers is pointed out in, in the lyrics to Daddy Lessons where Beyonce's father expresses to her to not choose a partner like himself and to shoot him if he comes anywhere near her, which implies that he isn't a good partner and wants Beyonce to do better than her mother. Some people suppress or dismiss their anger instead of blaming other factors such as problems within the relationship, thinking maybe I deserve it or the adage that's just how men are. Anger is complicated because at least in American society we're not supposed to be angry at our partners in general. People think that denotes an unhealthy relationship. This may explain why some wrong partners may move through the anger stage quickly and others avoid it altogether. Beyonce sings, I ain't sorry, I ain't thinking about you, showing her apathy as tennis star Serena Williams dances next to her. But despite its place in Lemonade, apathy isn't a common stage of dealing with infidelity. Beyonce's apathy is followed by the emptiness and loss with her singing on six inch heels come back. But these two stages can often be switched. You might feel that loss and then move to emptiness afterwards, where you say, I feel so betrayed, that trust truly is gone. Beyonce decides to make the cheater accountable, detailing in general some men's unjust behavior towards their wives. She says, did he bend your reflection? Did he make you forget your own name? Did he convince you he was God? She asks in the album, are you a slave to the back of his head? This line here paints a vivid picture of the things most women are expected to deal with, especially black women. All all three of these, accountability, reformation, and forgiveness, are part of the rebuilding process, but some people don't reach them. She said, with loss, the betrayed partner may feel as if he or she can never fully trust another person again. But if the perpetrator admits his or her wrongs and acknowledges how the betrayal affected the partner, a stage that doesn't always happen, that can set the stage for reformation. Jay-Z has completely assumed the role of the wrongdoer with him releasing 444, where he confesses his infidelity. I feel like because Jay-Z was able to take accountability, it saved their marriage and allowed them to discuss it in public. The other freedom I see in the album is just a freedom for couples who have gone through something. Yeah. You know, it's amazing 
you know, it's almost a cliche, you know, the celebrity couple, you know, they get together, they break up, you know, I'm like, well, who else are they gonna go out with? But for some reason, you took an unprecedented stand to fight for this marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, to fight for it mm -hmm. and to put it all out there. What is it about this marriage that's so special that you would fight this hard to, to save it? Well, it's my soulmate, it's the person I love, you know, and you, and you, you can be in love with someone, you can love someone and you're not, and if you haven't experienced love and you don't understand it and you don't have the tools to move forward, then you're gonna have complications, period. And if you, you can either address it or you can pretend until it blows up at some point. And, you know, for us, we chose to fight for our love, for our family, to give our kids a different outcome. You see, see you know, to break that, that cycle. Um, for black men and women, you know, just to see a different outcome, like you were saying. It's not this celebrity couple. We, we were never a celebrity couple. We were a couple who just happened to be celebrities. In the film, Beyonce walks through water saying, he bathes me until I forget their names and faces. This water scene is no mistake, as water is often a symbol of rebirth and renewal. During this time, couples can reset their expectations, boundaries, and love for one another. Reformation is like a reset button a stage where partners can begin to rebuild their trust in each other. However, forgiveness is needed to get there. This includes self-forgiveness, in case the betrayed partner blames himself or herself for causing the infidelity, as well as forgiving the partners. Forgiveness is not dismissing or forgetting about the betrayal. It's also not punishing the perpetrator forever, which can be difficult because we live in a very eye-for-eye -eye society. Instead, it involves acknowledging what happened and moving on. Or as Beyonce says, if we're gonna heal, let it be glorious. As the album nears its end, Beyonce talks about reconnecting with her husband and finding hope in their child, Blue Ivy Carter. You're the magician, Beyonce says. Pull me back together again, the way you cut me in half. Make the woman in doubt disappear. Resurrection can lead to hope, which can make people stronger than they were before. Redemption, like accountability, shows a high level of awareness for one's sins. Redemption is a powerful stage that a lot of people won't allow themselves to get into. It really involves acknowledging you've done wrong and the people it impacted in your life. In 444, Jay-Z acknowledges is the wrong he has done to Beyonce. And in Lemonade, Beyonce addresses how she felt during the betrayal. The imagery of Lemonade is very reminiscent of post-antebellum Southern culture with specific emphasis on Black American culture. Black death is a term used by scholar Rachel Gansha to describe the continuous challenges Black people face in America. It's the loss and unfair treatment that puts Black people at a disadvantage and makes fulfillment in life unreachable. Successful Black people are tasked with the role to bring other Black people up with them. In the words of Rachel Gansha, in my mind, three generations of progress would be undone by my vain commitment to tell stories about Black people in a country where the Black narrative was a quinoxic notion at best. If I knew anything about being Black in America, it was that nothing was guaranteed. As a successful for black women in a political climate where outward racism is making a comeback, Beyonce felt the need to be assertive and unapologetic in her blackness. In Lemonade, where she acknowledged the infidelity of her husband Jay-Z, Beyonce also used historic and folkloric references to black figures. In the video for her song Daddy Lessons, she is wearing a traditional southern gown and is singing in a style most associated with country music. Another example of pulling from historical black sources and folklore is Hold Up, the album's second single. Beyonce appears as Ocean, a Yoruba goddess of of female sensuality, love, and fertility. In her song Formation, she says, my daddy Alabama, mama Louisiana, you mix that Negro with that Creole, make a Texas Bama. This is a nod to her roots and to Southern Louisiana. Beyonce's maternal ancestry is Louisiana Creole. To historians, the term Creole is a controversial and mystifying segment of African-American culture. Creoles are commonly known as people mixed with French, African, Spanish, and Native American ancestry. Many who reside in or have familiar ties to Louisiana. The video for her song, Sorry, Beyonce is joined by fellow women on the bus called Boy Bye, their faces painted in Ori, a sacred Yoruba tradition. Many of the album is a message to young black women to love themselves and celebrate her family's history. One PBS article questions, what does an hour long visual album rich in African and Southern African American tradition do beyond get people talking? They state that Yeboa said it sends a message to young women of color to continue to strive and move forward. PBS goes on to say, some things in the film that just aren't that deep, but are still powerful. 
whether you're 21, 31, or 12. This empowers women. Not everyone took Beyonce's desire to be authentic and uplifting in a positive way. Professor Tiana Steptoe writes, some white fans reacted angrily. The hashtag boycott Beyonce circulated on social media. Saturday Night Live spoofed negative white reaction with a video called The Day Beyonce Turned Black, which is probably one of the most problematic skits in SNL history. To her fans and critics, it was clear that Beyonce had made her racial identity and modern racial politics central to her political image in 2016. According to one PBS article, throughout the visual album, the use of natural hairstyles and clothing and beading draws inspiration from Nigeria and the Maasai of Kenya. In Beyonce's 2008 song, Creole, she says, so all my red bones get to the floor and all my yellow bones get on the floor and all my brown bones get on the floor. Then you mix it up, you call it Creole. The backlash that came with Beyonce's black recognition were caused because these were not the words or images typically associated with Queen Bee at the time. Steptoe writes that in both Creole and Formation, Beyonce positions herself as a mixture of different places and colors. That heritage, however, does not negate the fact that she is a Black American woman. Blackness is a broad enough spectrum to encompass a Creole ethnic identity. Beyonce's Lemonade gathers a community of Black women in comparison to Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved in that before her death, Beloved's grandmother, Babe Baby Suggs, models the achievement of embodiedness through community. This inequality is one of the most important themes of the Southern Gothic, and its victims are consistently African Americans. Beyonce's Lemonade is reflective and considered to be a visual landscape that is tightly packed with a consistent iconography of Black Southern women's history of the past and present. She shot multiple scenes in the Alger's neighborhood, a section of Southern Louisiana that is famed for being the birthplace place of some jazz music and historically black churches that sculpted black history for freed slaves in the south. As an artist, she chose historic black neighborhoods to film in southern Louisiana to pay homage to her heritage there. The authenticity and thought behind each element of the visual album is inspiring and highlights Beyonce as more than a singer, but as an artist. By embracing her Southern Louisiana roots, she inspired other Black women to do so the same. I'm of Afro-Indigenous descent, and Lemonade definitely inspired me to own and appreciate my heritage in America. I feel like regardless of your race and ethnicity, people can relate to the pride that comes with celebrating one's own culture. Beyonce refers to her Creole culture to acknowledge her heritage and inspire other Black women and women in general to embrace themselves and their cultures. What does the rapper Little Nas X have in common with Queen Bee? Both artists dared to challenge the status quo for Black musicians by entering the infamous country genre. Despite Black people being the reason for its existence, many country fans were angered when Beyonce dared to perform Daddy Lessons with the Dixie Chick. Honestly, this is one of my favorite performances by her, mainly due to the reason why she did it. Beyonce is well aware of the hate she receives from white conservative people in this country, and she does not care at all. I feel like her performing Daddy Lessons was a middle finger to the racists who don't see Blackness as worthy enough to grace the country stage. On live television, Beyonce's improbable performance with the Dixie Chicks at the 50th Annual Country Music Association Awards could not have gone more smoothly. With a giant band and brass section, the pop star blew through an extra twangy version of Daddy Lessons, even working in the section of the Dixie Chicks' own Long Time Gone in the middle. The Nashville crowd was on its feet, but online the reception was decidedly more mixed, with some country fans arguing that Beyonce, who has recently, recently leaned harder into activism, around police reform in the Black Lives Matter movement had no place at the ceremony. Why are you showing Beyonce and the Dixie Chicks one doesn't believe in America and our police force while the other didn't support our president and veterans during the war? One commenter wrote on Facebook alluding to each act's past political movements. Another added, neither our country and Beyonce could not be bothered to put some clothes on for the occasion. Beyonce, according to one common sentiment, isn't really what country represents. Others were plainly racist. Beyonce's exceedingly loyal fan base, widely known as the Beehive, did not take kindly to this disrespect. After some Beyonce supporters noticed that a promotional post from Wednesday announced the singer's surprise performance had been deleted from the Country Music Awards Twitter and Facebook accounts. Fans and gossip sites speculated that the award show was scrubbing its Beyonce coverage to minimize the backlash. For revenge, the Beehive began flooding the CMA Instagram with its weaponized emoji of choice, lemons and bees. In an interview, Sarah Terran, the chief executive of the CMA Association, executive of the Country Music Association, acknowledged the strong reactions on both sides, but denied any nefarious deleting had taken place. The initial promotion clip teasing Beyonce's performance was removed on Wednesday 
before the performance, at the request of the singer, she said. Representative for Beyonce did not immediately respond to requests for comment. As for the minimal after the fact documentation, Beyonce's team hadn't approved that so we pulled it down, Miss Taryn said of the teaser. She went on saying, fans can get kind of passionate and read other things into it. As for the minimal after the fact documentation of the sudden controversial performance of the show's social media channels, Miss Taryn said that Beyonce, who is known to be vigilant about her image, provided her own photographer. Pictures are available at Beyonce.com and that the singer's team had only approved one official live video of the song on ABC.com. After the show, Beyonce also released an alternate version of Daddy Lessons Online, as well as a standalone video for the song from her Lemonade film. As you see, this era is jam-packed with information, too much for just one video. Stay tuned for part two where I talk about the second phase of the Lemonade era, where she creates another pop culture moment that made performance art history. This was the moment Beyonce declared her love and appreciation for HBCU culture. This was Coachella. Peace out. The cultural significance of On The Run Tour cannot be underestimated. Besides being a defining moment of 2010's pop culture, it truly shows what can happen when two of the most influential music artists collaborate putting aside ego. Collaborating with another artist yet a significant other just shows how dedicated Jay-Z and Beyonce are to their craft. I recognize fully that these two are humans just like you and I. I'm an aspiring music artist and my love and appreciation for great music makes me seek out other artists like them for inspiration. It gives me hope that creativity in the music industry is far from dead. No other duo in the music industry has such an ability to pull such a wide range of people to their work with such a universal story. That universal story being love and heartbreak. By the end of the album, we see that Beyonce did indeed choose to stay in her marriage. And the follow-up to this to show their progress would be them releasing Everything Is Love and touring together on the On The Run Part 2 tour. For some reason, Beyonce and Jay-Z have mastered the art of vulnerability, and on the run we see a, a more vulnerable sensual side to both of them that usually is kept fiercely private. On the run followed by on the run part 2 and the release of Everything Is Love is the start of a series of love letters Beyonce grants to her fans as a thank you. In this video, I want to take a detour from Beyonce's solo albums and do a retrospective of on the run 1, on the run part 2, and their collaboration project Everything Is Love. Now let's get into it. Beyonce and Jay-Z first collaborated in 2002 on O3 Bonnie and Clyde, a song from Jay-Z's seventh studio album, The Blueprint 2, The Gift and the Curse. Since then, other notable collaborations between the pair include Beyonce's 2003 number one song, Crazy in Love, 2013's Part 2 on the Run, which is widely regarded as the follow-up to O3 Bonnie and Clyde and Drunk in Love, the couple's collaboration from Beyonce's self-titled fifth album, which was unexpectedly released in December 2013. In July 2013, Jay-Z stated that a joint tour with Beyonce was slowly making sense, more sense every day. Throughout 2013 and 2014, during Beyonce's The Miss Carter World Show Tour, Jay-Z made multiple guest appearances starting in July at the Sound of Change live charity concert where the couple performed Crazy in Love together, shortly followed by another guest appearance at the Brooklyn Barclay Center in August, where Jay-Z performed Tom Ford accompanied by Beyonce's backing vocals as found in the song. During Beyonce's final leg of the tour in 2014, Jay-Z appeared a total of seven times to perform their most recent collaboration, Drunk in Love, together. Jay-Z accompanied Beyonce on all the six nights of her O2 Arena stint in London and finally at the last night of her tour in Lisbon. Rumors of a co-heading stadium tour from Beyonce and Jay-Z first circulated on April 15th, 2014, when Page Six reported that a source had revealed that the power couple would be partaking in 20 stadium US tours starting in late July, and that a performance in New York could take place on July 4th. When it was reported that the Pasadena City Council were holding a meeting to decide whether to approve the couple's proposed concert on August 2nd, 2014 at the Rose Bowl. The tour was conceived and launched fast compared to most stadium tours. According to Live Nation, who noted that most tours of this nature take more than a year of planning, compared to the On The Run tour that took around one month, the tour was stated to have a running theme throughout the performance of being on the run by the Miami New Times. Whether it's from the media, their place in pop music, the haters, the BS, and sometimes even each other. When explaining the concept of the tour and its accompanying videos in a telephone conversation to New York-based director Daikalo Ramash, I don't know how to say his name, Jay-Z stated, We're not trying to do this literally. It's not that we're Bonnie and Clyde. 
were on the run from everything, on the run from being a cliche, on the run from doing the same thing again. During their individual performances, Beyonce was often backed by both male and female dancers, and Jay-Z was noted to hold the stage for multiple songs without assistance. Beyonce was backed by an all-female band during her solo songs, whilst Jay-Z was accompanied by other male instrumentalists. However, both artists' musicians collaborated for the majority of the performances. Video interludes filled with cop chases and other violent outbursts carried the storytelling between songs and give a vintage late 50s, early 1960s aesthetic. The performances of the joint tour was said to be split up similarly to Jay-Z's previous joint venture with Kanye West, the Watch the Throne tour. Jay-Z and Beyonce would take turns holding down the stage, beginning with several songs by Beyonce first, followed by duets and afterwards Jay-Z rapping his song. Both artists sported multiple outfits from a variety of fashion designers throughout the performance of the tour. In Beyonce's case, makeup artist Sir John Barnett commented on her quick changes backstage between performances, comparing them to Daytona 500, with every member on her team working on a separate part of her look. When I watched the DVD for On The Run, I noticed how many times it'd be changed and each costume change made sense with the theme of the songs she was singing. One of the most prominent designers for the tour was Versace, in which Beyonce wore both a fishnet and leather atelier black body suit, complete with plunging neckline and fishnet head mask and high heel combat boots, as well as a colorful antelier bodysuit from the designer. This is one of my favorite looks from the tour, by the way. The leather antelier black bodysuit took approximately 200 hours to craft and was used for the opening number of the tour, 03 Bonnie and Clyde. The colorful bodysuit was commented on by Versace, who stated that the team had their inspiration from the street with their color and added various crystals and stripes to show a baseball vibe, while also trying to capture Beyonce's energy. Beyonce's tour shoes were designed by Stuart Weitzman and Joker's Closet. Other outfits include a denim jumpsuit and a bedazzled leotard jumpsuit bodysuit that showed off her fabulous derriere. Beyonce also sported more thematic and dramatic pieces of clothing, including a full bridal veil and a sweeping train made of a black and white American flag. The American flag outfit was designed by Ricardo Tisci of Givenchy and took over 500 hours to create. The American flag was roughly 16 feet long and weighs about 500 grams, allowing it to fly in the wind. The individual stars on the outfit were hand embroidered and its inspiration was said to be American Danger, Bonnie and Clyde with a modern twist. Alexander Wayne designed a bondage bodysuit worn by Beyonce during the show, as well as multiple pieces by Nicola Formichetti for Diesel. One of these included the previously mentioned denim outfit, which was made from the company's patent jog jean material accented with hand applied hardware and stud work, short sweet crystals, elements, and black leather accessories worn for the performance of Run the World Girls. Formichetti commented on the outfit saying every classic cops and robber story blurs the line between good and bad. We want Beyonce to be both. Her look is one part of police officer and two parts gel bait. Another piece designed by Deez was an outfit consisting of jean shorts and a leather jacket embroidered with the word Texas. Biker gangs that developed in the United States after World War II served as inspiration for the outfit. Beyonce's was meant as a tribute to her hometown and a reminder of her roots. It took about four to five hours to add the word Texas to the leather jacket. The bondage bodysuit was described as a riff off to an urban bomber hoodie jacket that was cropped to expose a bondage bodysuit underneath that had graphic cutouts. When worn up, the oversized hood covers the face, adding to the incognito element reminiscent of the on the run theme. It also contained snakeskin seamed into the sleeves of the outfit. One of the more controversial pieces worn by Beyonce during the on the run tour was a black thong leotard that put her bare rear on display in a kind of cage-like cutout. Lebanese designer Ellie Saab created a bridal theme, white long sleeve lace embellished jumpsuit for Beyonce for the performance of Resentment and Love on Top, which was part of his pre-fall 2014 collection. Jay-Z's fashion was noted to be Kanye-esque, with pieces worn by him including rotating ensembles of black leather as well as giant billowing pant scarves. For the opening performance, Jay-Z appeared on the stage in black sunglasses, gold chains, gold chains, a black and white star speckled shirt, and black jacket. During the performance of Big Pimpin', Jay-Z wore a fedora. Way. 
On Saturday, June 16th, the world was given a gift in the form of music. Beyonce and Jay-Z released a surprise album, Everything Is Love, giving all of us a fresh batch of new favorite songs. The album marks the end of the first leg of their On The Run Part 2 tour and is made up of nine obviously amazing songs. At launch, the album was available to stream on Jay-Z's music service, Tidal. They also released a music video for their song, Ape Shit. It was filmed at the Louvre Museum in Paris and is exactly as glamorous as it seems as fans scramble to find out everything they possibly can about this latest collaboration between the husband and wife power couple, some interesting facts were released and there were some hitting meetings in Everything Is Love that you definitely need to know. While the album release was definitely a surprise, it wasn't exactly super shocking. Ever since they announced their joint tour back in March 2018, fans had expected them to drop something big. It's just that no one knew when it was going to happen. Beyonce first made the announcement of the album on her Instagram and Twitter by simply sharing the album cover and music video, no caption necessary. Classic Queen B. Fans were shocked, thrilled, and beyond excited. As it turns out though, there has been many more hints on the release date than we thought. As was to be expected, fans have investigated the album thoroughly, as well as all of J and B's moments leading up to the release, and they found some pretty interesting information. One Twitter user pointed out that Beyonce announced the release of the album 63 days after she made a six and a three hand signal at her iconic Coachella performance. Another Twitter user compared two photos of the power couple. One is from 2014 when Jay-Z and Beyonce visited the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, and took a photo standing in front of the famous Mona Lisa. The second photo is Beyonce and Jay-Z during the new music video for Ape Shit, once again standing at the Louvre in front of the Mona Lisa. I also really liked their congratulations video to Meghan Markle and Harry when they married. Actually scratch that, Beyonce actually made the video when she won the 2019 Brit Award. Thank you so much to the Brit Awards for this incredible honor. You guys have always been so supportive. Everything is love. Thank you. You're welcome. It had this black renaissance feel which permeates the theme of the entire project. Its main goal, in my opinion, was to showcase blackness and high art. The lyrical content on the album also incorporates themes of black love and perceived importance of black generational wealth. There were some critiques that pointed out the contradictory nature of black capitalism as it pertains to the messages in the album. Some called this all you do is this approach to wealth building a bit insensitive considering both Jay-Z and Beyonce are billionaires, but that's a discussion for an entirely different video. My favorite songs on the project are Heard About Us and Ape Shit, mainly because of its video, which was a completely original concept for both Jay-Z and Beyonce. Before renting the museum for the video shoot, Beyonce and Jay-Z had visited the Louvre four times in the last 10 years. During their visit in May 2018, they explained their idea of filming. Filmed in the world-famous Louvre Museum in Paris, the Carter's choice of location prompted awe from social media users, amazed by the level of flex involving in renting out such an iconic space. As far as we know, On The Run Part 2 DVD is either still in the works for a later release or scrapped entirely. I personally have given up on the hope that we ever will see an On The Run Part 2 DVD until at least the visuals for Renaissance drop. Billboard stated the tour could double the On The Run tour's gross, predicting it could gross between 180 million to 200 million if the success of the previous tour is replicated, which it was. Following the day of the general sale, an extra show was added in Amsterdam after the first date sold out within an hour, as well as in Paris, Landover, East Rutherford, Chicago, Atlanta, Houston, Pasadena, and London. Newly added shows were also announced on March 20th in Columbus. Billboard ranked the On The Run Part 2 tour as the third highest grossing tour of the year, selling over 2 million tickets and grossing over $250 million. Beyonce and Jay-Z are known for being incredibly symbolic and purposeful with the imagery they use for their art, and On The Run Tour was no different. Through doing some research, I have come across some theories about On The Run Tour. One is more lighthearted, and the other is a little bit more sinister. Now let's get into it. You trust me? Did I bring out the best in you? Absolutely. <laughs> Jay-Z and Beyonce are famous and married, therefore it's expected that their marriage will be the subject of intense scrutiny. The double tour puts it on display, arguably the idea of seeing the relationship in action is much of a draw as seeing each of the two talents performing. Reviewers during the first half of the tour have parsed the show for clues about the couple's personal life and decided they found some. Most notably in Beyonce shifting the lyric of the R&B ballad Resentment, a song of hurt by a betrayed lover to make it sound as if it were directed at her husband. If you wanted to find a 
story, some of the song placements told one, If I Were a Boy, sung in a sullen, heavy pout, came after 99 Problems, followed by Jay-Z's breakup regret musing song, Song Cry, and then a soulful tang on resentment. Then afterwards, Forgiveness is the Final Act of Love, appeared on screen, a joyous love on top. So the set list kind of goes from heartbreak and betrayal to love and satisfaction. Theory number two is this is not real life. The first message on the video screens announced that it referred directly to the dramatic video montages that ran between songs depicting the couple driving across the desert in a vintage car, riding horses and shooting guns. And it would also be well taken as a caveat for the show itself. Yes, there were runs of songs that made you wonder if there was a code to crack. Jay-Z smooched to his wife's neck at the close of Drunken Love seemed like a spontaneous affection until reading other tour reviews revealed that the kiss is at least sometimes part of the choreography. But then again, there were genuine moments. Beyonce mouthed his lyrics with a grin even when she was joining in on the mic. Jay-Z watched his wife sing with appreciation. It's never advisable to speculate on what's going on in personal lives of strangers. That goes double when the strangers are massive stars and professional performers with demonstrated interest in controlling their public image with fierce discipline. This is real life, read the screen at the show's end, as a reel of, of the Cardinals family home movies played and the couple faced away from the crowd, arms around each other watching footage in their wedding, family parties and their daughter at play. Was it like everything else that was unfurled on the stage? It was beautifully put together, polished and compelling, and exactly what the pair wanted us to see. Some critics have said that Beyonce and Jay-Z used to revive their careers or as a publicity stunt or for a quick cash grab. I personally don't believe Beyonce and Jay-Z faked their marriage struggles. However, I do think that by the time On The Run came around, they were working past their issues or already worked on them enough to go on tour. I highly doubt Beyonce would have gone on tour if their marriage was still on the rocks. In a way, this is a smart way to talk about your relationship in public as a celebrity. If the issues are already resolved, you'll be more inclined to be more personable. And that's exactly what they did on this tour. Peace out. Everybody, everything is love. In my opinion, Lemonade is the longest era in the Beyonce cinematic universe. Starting in 2016, we are just closing out the Lemonade era with Renaissance. I split the Lemonade era into two parts essentially. In the first part, we are introduced to the political activist side of Beyonce through dramatic performances and visuals. This was when Beyonce drew the line in the sand, and public opinion of her has never been the same since. The white people who saw her as the token black have fallen off, leaving her core fan base of those who truly love her as an artist and musician. The second part of the Lemonade era was the love saga between Beyonce and Jay-Z that concluded with Everything Is Love, the On The Run Part 2 tour, and the announcement of Beyonce's second pregnancy. Also, the second part of this era is when we see Beyonce start to use her industry credentials to create truly unique projects with the help of like-minded artists. Beyonce announced her second pregnancy as only Queen Bee could with an epic Instagram photo on February 1st, 2017. We would like to share our love and happiness, the Grammy winner captioned the Instagram shot on Wednesday. We have been blessed two times over. We are incredibly grateful that our family, we thank you for your well wishes. Beyonce was adorned with lingerie and a veil and kneeling in front of a large flower wreath, cradling her baby bump in the colorful photo. She famously announced her last pregnancy at the 2011 MTV Video Music Awards. She unbuttoned her sequin tuxedo at the end of her performance of Love on Top, literally dropped her mic and rubbed her belly. The Instagram photo generated more than 1.2 million likes on Instagram within 30 minutes and more than 2.4 million in an hour. More than half a million tweets were sent about the news within 45 minutes of Beyonce's reveal. Hashtag twins also became a trending topic a few minutes after the announcement. The pregnancy was not all roses and sunshine for Beyonce though, as it was reported that she experienced numerous complications during her second pregnancy. In 2018, Beyonce made history as the first black woman to headline the music festival Coachella. In a documentary that premiered on Netflix in 2019, Beyonce describes her efforts to prepare for the performance while recovering from an extremely difficult pregnancy. My body went through more than I knew it could, Beyonce says at one point in the film, before sharing details about her experience of carrying and delivering twins. While she was pregnant, Beyonce developed a complication known as preeclampsia. This condition can cause dangerously high blood pressure. It can restrict fetal growth and increase the risk of preterm delivery. In severe cases, it can also cause life-threatening seizures, 
known as eclampsia. When one of her twins showed signs of distress in the womb, Beyonce had to undergo an emergency C-section that left her with a deep incision in her abdomen, from which it took time to heal. I had to rebuild my body from cut muscles, she said in the film. There were days where I thought, you know, I never could be the same. I'd never be the same physically. My strength and endurance would never be the same. Also around this time, the media was becoming more conscious of the systematic inequality that leads black women, regardless of socioeconomic class, to be at a heightened risk during pregnancy. Despite giving birth the year prior, the year 2019 was a very busy year for Beyonce. Homecoming will go down in history as one of the best performances of the 21st century, with so much culture and so much talent packed into a two-hour performance. Homecoming is a 2019 concert film about Beyonce's performance at the 2018 Coachella Valley Music Festival and Arts Festival, written, executive produced, and directed by Beyonce herself. It was released on April 17, 2019 by Netflix. The film is an intimate, in-depth look at the performance, revealing the emotional road from creative concept to a cultural movement. Beyonce opens the Netflix portrait of her Coachella performance with a telling statement in her voiceover. When I decided to do Coachella, it was important that I brought our history and culture to Coachella, she says at the beginning of her Netflix special, which was released alongside a 40-track live album, which is an amazing album, by the way. The documentary works overtime to reflect Beyonce's desire to bring blackness to the stage. The 137-minute concert film weaves in quotes, both written and spoken, that function almost like chapter headings. Each of them comes from black cultural luminary, some living, others dead. Some of them are alumni of historically black colleges and universities, also known as HBCUs. For Beyonce, who rarely tells the world what she thinks in any medium beyond her music, these citations likely serve as lessons from and reverence for African-American elders as she takes steps to ensure the preservation of African-American cultural heritage on a platform that she knows will engage millions. This is similar to the Lemonade film, where Beyonce looks at her foremothers for lessons in dealing with an unfaithful lover. As the first African-American woman to headline Coachella since its founding in 1999, it was important for her to appropriately represent the culture, its past and present. It's an obvious theme the superstar symbolically highlights in her performance by incorporating artifacts of Black cultural legacy and pride, including Black Panther inspired outfits and dance routines. Additionally, it was a love letter to more than 150 years of HBCUs and pays tribute to the iconic 20th century African-American writers and musicians with their own words. The film opens with a quote from Pulitzer Prize winning author Toni Morrison, if you can surrender to the air, you can ride it. A very wise quote to open with, one that speaks to Beyonce's driven personality and strict management of her public image. Morrison's quote is a challenge to occasionally surrender, which is something that Beyonce does to some extent in Homecoming by revealing intimate thoughts and moments in her life that offer further insight to who she is. Legendary songstress Nina Simone, a key voice in the civil rights movement who blended activism with her music, is heard in a lengthy replay of an interview speaking about the supreme importance of Black culture. I think what you are trying to ask is why I'm so insistent in giving out to them that Blackness, that power, that Black power that black, pushing them to identify more with black culture. Simone says, I have no choice over it in the first place. To me, we are the most beautiful creatures in the world, black people. And I mean that in every sense. The voiceover continues over grainy handheld rehearsal footage of Beyonce and her teams of dancers. As Simone shares her ambition to compel other black people to become more aware and not to be ashamed of their blackness nor their history calling it a job that she was compelled to do. Simone's words are probably the clearest distillation of what Beyonce ultimately wants to achieve with Homecoming, as both unapologetic champion of blackness as reassurance. Some of the citations are more straightforward in their intentions, with an excerpt from W.E.B. Du Bois, another HBCU alum, on the importance of education. The film leads into a segment showcasing students in celebratory moods at HBCUs across the country, including Jackson State University and Florida A&M University. Additionally, there are also quotations from the novelist and poet and poet Alice Walker, The Color Purple, Marion Wright Edelman, the first African-American woman admitted to the Mississippi bar, Audre Lorde, the self-described black lesbian mother, warrior, and poet, Maya Angelou, Malcolm X, and Reginald Lewis, the first African-American to build a billion dollar company. Collectively, their words address the need for recognition, solidarity, community and perseverance with a fixation on the future. But confronting the future, of course, requires 
a clearer understanding of the past. For Beyonce in Homecoming, Black history is American history, and the Black experience is the American experience. Her documentary underscores an apparent conviction that her role as an icon living is to use Black history and culture as a sledgehammer in an ongoing struggle for the absolute recognition of Black humanity. With the film, Beyonce's goal is to normalize Blackness. To that end, there's a keen attitude that comes through in Homecoming, that it's perfectly timed to reflect a rise in an interest in Black cultural expression. This film could even be seen as an ideological kin to the recent works from Black filmmakers as far reaching as Ramel Bross and Jordan Peele's, both expressingly call attention to Blackness in contemporary life as prosaic, with the former being just as concerned with connecting the present with the past. Beyonce's work reflects a desire to build on the current moment momentum surrounding Black identity and further stimulate interest in Black culture by celebrating historic Black figures and illustrating Black subjectivity across the decades. More than that, she seems intent on increasing the visibility of contemporary Black life at a time when news headlines are mobbed with stories of racial conflict and despair. With Homecoming, she argues that her mission to excavate Black history while showcasing Black contemporary culture remains a vital one. She did it by bringing a historic performance by Coachella in with her film by putting its significance in contact. Homecoming was released to widespread critical acclaim, with several publications naming it one of the best concert films of all time. The film won Best Music Film at the 62nd Annual Grammy Awards and Best Music Documentary at the IDA Documentary Awards in 2019. Like I said, Beyonce almost creates a cinematic universe with Lemonade Era that successfully incorporates different cultures within the African diaspora. Lemonade Film and Homecoming was her love letter to Black American culture, and her collaboration project, The Gift, was her love letter to Africa. What I love about Beyonce's artistry is how dedicated she is to collaborating with creative people to create entirely new concepts. Beyonce has evolved from a pop star to a machine that creates atmospheres for music listeners to plunge themselves in. I mentioned that Beyonce takes inspiration from the intersections of her identity, and ever since releasing Self Titled, she has been chipping away at those intersections. Self Titled was when Beyonce declared herself a feminist because of her identity as a woman, and adds depth to it in the Lemonade era celebrating her cultural heritage in America, as well as critiquing the Black woman's place in American society. Her collaboration project, The Gift, is her celebrating the roots of Blackness, which is located in the continent of Africa. I can tell Beyonce really enjoyed making this project and was proud of its outcome. The album and its visuals are spectacular and honestly should have been released as its own separate project aside from The Lion King. Beyonce is fully matured as an artist and you can see her embracing her identity as a mother and how spiritually divine that role is in human society. The Lion King The Gift, frequently referred to as simply The Gift, is a soundtrack album created for the 2019 photorealistic animated remake of The Lion King and for Black is King, released in 2020. It was released on July 19th, 2019 by Parkwood Entertainment and Columbia Records. The album was also produced by Beyonce and features African artists such as Wizkid, Shada Wale, Burna Boy, Mr. Easy, Tua Savage, Techno, Yemi Alade, Busiswana, Moonchild, Sonale, and Salashio, as well as appearances from J. Jay-Z, Blue Ivy Carter, Childish Gambino, Pharrell Williams, Kendrick Lamar, Tierra Wack, O70 Shake, and Jesse Reyes, among others. On July 9th, 2019, it was revealed that Beyonce produced and curated an album titled The Lion King, The Gift. Beyonce called the album Sonic Cinema and said that the film is a new experience of storytelling and that the album is influenced from everything from R&B to pop to hip hop to Afrobeat. Beyonce also said that she wanted to put everyone on their own journey to link the storyline and that the songs were inspired by the the remix storyline, which gives the listener a chance to imagine their own imagery while listening to a new contemporary interpretation. The songs were also produced by African producers, which Beyonce said was because authenticity and heart were important to her since the film is set in Africa. The tracklist was revealed through Beyonce's official website on July 16, 2019. On September 16, 2019, Beyonce released a behind the scenes TV special titled Beyonce Presents Making the Gift, documenting the album's creation and her journey through Africa, shot in Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa and the United States. We just landed in Africa. I was blessed to be able to relive some of the experiences that I've been very fortunate to have over the years with my entire family. 
The documentary was aired on ABC. It was written, directed, and produced by Beyonce alongside co-director Ed Burke and executive producers Steve Pammon and Aaron Williams. African musicians and producers who worked on The Lion King, The Gift, amongst others, have spoken on the impact they predicted the album would have on African music in the United States. Ghanaian producer Guilty Beats said, Now that Beyonce released a whole album of African music, this will open the gateway for those sounds to enter the American market. Nigerian singer Yemi Aloud added that the album will be another awakening. Nigerian producer P2J described how the album is going to change the face of music, adding that, adding that, Brown Skin Girl is one of the first songs in my career I thought was going to be very special. It's a big moment for Africa. South African artist DJ Lag said that the album had opened doors for him and that the sound of The Lion King The Gift is going to be the next big thing. Bloomberg's Anthony Ase stated that The Lion King The Gift, Beyonce is taking the Nigerian music scene global. Director of urban music at YouTube, Tuma Basa, called the release of The Lion King The Gift a tipping point moment, while Nigerian producer E. Kelly said that it's going to create a new awareness and open a big crack for Afrobeats to enter American mainstream music. The track Brown Skin Girl inspired a viral trend called Brown Skin Girl Challenge, where black women and girls post pictures and videos of themselves in celebration of their skin, as well as people encouraging their young family members to be proud of their skin. Celebrities including Ava DuVernay, Barbara Lee, Gabrielle Union, and Lupita Nyong'o participated in this trend. Several think pieces and articles were also produced in response to Brown Skin Girl. At the 2019 Soul Train Music Awards, Spirit was nominated for Best Video of the Year and Best Dance Performance, while Brown Skin Girl was nominated for Best Collaboration and the Ashford and Simpson Songwriters Award, winning the latter. The Lion King The Gift was nominated for Best Pop Vocal Album at the 62nd Annual Grammy Awards, while Spirit received two nominations for Best Pop Solo Performance and Best Song Written for Visual Media. Brown Skin Girl went on to Best Music Video at the 63rd Annual Grammy Awards. A musical film and visual album based on the music of The Gift was released on July 31st, 2020 on Disney+. Plus. The film directed, written, and executive produced by Beyonce tells the story of a young African prince who is exiled from his kingdom after the death of his father. This is Black as King. As he grows up into a man, the prince undergoes a journey of self-identity using the guidance of his ancestors' childhood love and his own subconscious to reclaim his throne. The prince's journey acts as an allegory for the African diaspora's journey of rediscovering, reclaiming, and celebrating their culture and heritage, which is echoed by the inclusion of spoken word, poetry, in the film that, that focuses on the question of Black identity. Black is King was in production for over a year and was filmed across three continents. Beyonce wanted to recruit a diverse cast and crew and provide opportunities for new talent. The film's music, dances, costumes, hairstyles, and sets were designed to showcase the beauty and richness of the cultures in the African continent and diaspora. The film received universal acclaim from critics with praise for Beyonce's direction, the cinematography score, costume design, subject matter, and cultural themes. At the 63rd Annual Grammy Awards, Black is King was nominated for Best Music Film. Beyonce's artistry does not end with this era, as we are in the midst of the Renaissance era, her love letter to the queer community. Don't worry, I plan on doing a full deep dive of that when the visuals drop. Until then, thank you for joining me in this mini series. There will be definitely more to come, so be sure to look out for the next poll to decide who will be a topic for the next season of The Genius.